Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Judy, for the invitation uh, to be here. Thank you all uh, for coming. So uh, this is a problem uh, uh, that I've been uh, focusing on for about the last 25 years. Uh, and, um, and what I want to present to, uh, this morning is, uh, is primarily focused on uh, multi-layer printed circuit boards with, uh, with area fills. Okay, so now I know a number of you also work on, um, on products that, uh, you know, that uh, in particular mobile products that you might route uh, power with, uh, you know, simply on traces. And that's a different strategy uh, uh, that I'm not going to, uh, uh, going to talk about here. So uh, I just, uh, you know, just uh, sort of briefly, this is, uh, I pulled this slide from the, you know, from the second part here. I want to talk, you know, it's just a, a two-part series. The first part uh, I want to talk about is really just some concept in physics. Uh, and, uh, and my objective is really to, uh, you know, to give a strategy for, uh, you know, for pre-layout power integrity. Uh, not just, you know, sort of, you know, design concepts, design methodologies and guidelines, but also uh, being able to do some, uh, you know, some design calculations uh, and also to develop the circuit uh, that Heidi was talking about yesterday. So, you know, uh, the, the, the scenario today is, is really, you know, we start with our, you know, with our, uh, you know, with our design specifications, and typically what the chip vendors will give us is the chip vendors will give us some voltage ripple specifications that are, you know, that are on die. Now, uh, now a lot of you, uh, a lot of the folks in here are doing, you know, the ASIC design, so that's you guys, okay? Uh, yeah, uh, so anyway, um, uh, you know, will give us these voltage ripple specifications. But on the printed circuit board or on the package, and what I'm talking about will apply equally well to the package, even though the package geometry looks more complicated. Uh, um, but, uh, but, but, but it's not, you know, the geometry is more complicated, but the physics, you know, and, uh, you know, and, the, you know, and the design implications are not uh, more complicated. But basically what we get is we get these, you know, sort of voltage ripple specs, and the way that they filter down to us on the printed circuit board or on the package is in terms of this target impedance that Heidi, uh, that Heidi uh, uh, indicated and talked about yesterday. And there's a reason, and I'll show you why, you know, it filters down to us uh, as this target impedance. Uh, but then we go to work, okay? We go to work on, you know, print circuit board, you know, and depending upon, you know, your level of experience, uh, you know, sort of the people around you and, you know, what you have at your disposal, um, you know, it can, you know, can range from, you know, sort of very methodical, you know, for a very experienced person, you have a lot of, you know, insight and knowledge on what to do, to uh, sometimes, you know, just getting down on your hands and knees and praying to all the angels and saints that it's going to work out okay. Uh, and so, you know, sort of you do the, you know, you do the layout, you know, in geometry, whatever your methodology from, you know, from very experienced, know exactly what you're doing, down on your hands and knees, all the angel saints, okay? Uh, and then what you do is you go to work with the, uh, with the commercial uh, power integrity tools. And these commercial power integrity tools are, you know, are good. You know, they're actually, they're quite good and they're mature. And I surmise that, you know, sort of quite a few of you in here you know, use one, the other, you know, one, you know, one or more of these tools. And I just list, you know, a couple of them, you know, a couple of them here. We use them as well, <clears throat> okay? But then, if you don't meet the, uh, you know, if you don't meet the target impedance, then you're sort of left to your own experience, okay? Or down on your hands and knees, playing all the angel saints, okay? You know, uh, you know, trial and error, you know, okay, you make a change, you know, okay, so you do the analysis, make a change, you meet the target impedance. No, go back, you know, sort of do some rearrangement, you know, run the tool, uh, you know, meet the target impedance, you know, and it's just sort of this rat race that, you know, that is easy to get stuck in, okay? And so what I really want to talk about here is I want to just talk about maybe uh, uh, a different, uh, you know, a different paradigm and a different approach uh, sort of that actually, uh, you know, that, you know, actually comes complements of uh, a number of a discussion a number of years ago uh, with one of my colleagues at Cisco. And, you know, we were standing around after I'd, you know, sort of given, you know, this very complicated, you know, sort of discussion of, you know, power integrity. And he said, you know, well, Jim, the way we think about it is this, blah, 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 blah. You know, and Stephen drew out, you know, sort of this picture of, you know, because uh, they, uh, they design you know, uh, high layer count boards, and he drew out this picture of current path physics and the inductance that goes along with those physics. 
And I stood there and thinking, it seems very good colleague, and I stood there thinking to myself, Stephen, you just trivialized what I spent the last 20 years sort of, of, of my life working at. I could have probably figured this out 20 years ago, and where were you 20 years ago? I didn't say that. Stephen was a very good colleague. But this sort of set in motion some collaboration with, uh, you know, with both Stephen and you know, a number of other colleagues from uh, some of the companies that we, we work with. And that's really what I'm going to articulate here to you today. So, Anyway, uh, but, um, but before I do, you know, just kind of some preliminaries here. Um, the primary reason, you know, sort of we care about power integrity is, is because it's impact, you know, on jitter, right? Uh, if, uh, if it didn't impact signal integrity in some way, shape, or form, we wouldn't care about it. I, us EMI guys, okay, so my, you know, I, I sort of cut my teeth in, you know, in EMC and EMI, right? And we like to pretend that, ooh, you know, power integrity is very important for, you know, EMI, but, but I, I haven't really run across any problems where sort of power integrity caused EMI problems where it didn't cause a signal integrity problem first. So, uh, so primarily we care about power integrity, you know, because of, uh, you know, because of its impact on, you know, on signal integrity. And that only gets a little bit more precarious as uh, you ASIC guys shrink, uh, shrink the logic level to zero, okay? You know, sort of we used to be at 5 volts, 3.3, 1.8, 1.2, 0.8, and then pretty soon we're going to be at zero. I don't know how that's going to work, but, um, but we'll deal with it when we get there, all right? So anyway, you know, sort of in the, uh, you know, um, the, thing that, um, the thing that can get really confusing is, is the geometry. I mean, uh, power integrity and the geometry on a, you know, on a typical, you know, high density uh, printed circuit board, high layer count printed circuit board, this geometry can be very complicated, you know. You know, hundreds of nets, thousands of nets, right? And even you know, for the uh, you know, for the power net, um, it'll have you know, it'll have many you know, it can have a few tens to you know, a few hundreds decoupling capacitors, uh, you know, you know, thousands of via segments, um, um, you know, where to put it. There's this whole laundry list of questions, you know, that can really be grouped into three categories. One category has to do with you know, sort of the power, you know, the power net area fill and where this resides, this power net area fill might reside in a stack. And then of course there's all sorts of things like, you know, how much, you know, total area fill, you know, what's the value of special materials, uh, you know, spacing to the power return plane, things like that. The other uh, uh, categories related to the decoupling capacitors and, you know, sort of the, the, the laundry list with the decoupling capacitors is even longer, right? Uh, you know, if my wife gave me a grocery list this long, I'd only come home with half of it probably on any given day, right? So, you know, you know where to put these decoupling capacitors? You know, what's the value of the total number? You know, sort of how do we connect them? You know, sort of do we put them close to the IC? You know, should we, can we clump them in one location? Just a whole laundry list of things. And then also, um, uh, also, there's uh, some related questions to the, you know, you know, to the uh, to the IC in the package, right? And many of you, uh, uh, with ASIC design and package design, actually control, you know, sort of this. Oftentimes, at the printed circuit board, uh, the uh, the engineers might not control that. So, uh, just a couple of preliminaries, sort of, you know, before I get to the uh, uh, get to, you know, sort of the the heart of the issue here. Also. I'm a university professor, right? So, you know, I have one of these voices that, you know, that I have, uh, I have refined over 26 years to put people to sleep, okay? So that's okay. Um, when it's time to wake up, when there's something really important and it's time to wake up, I'll just go, Psst, time to wake up, all right? That's your cue to wake up and, you know, it's sort of, you know, it, it may, it, I may have remembered to put on the slide key point, but if I didn't, I'll just, Psst, Time to wake up, okay? And then, and, then, uh, and, then, and then you just go back to sleep. So, so anyway, uh, just a reminder here of, uh, you know, of just some basic circuit behavior, right? You know, capacitor, decrease 20 dB per decade. Inductor and resistor, you know, resistor, uh, you know, flat with frequency. Inductor rises as 20 dB per decade. Uh, series resonance. Capacitor at low frequency behaves like a capacitor at low frequency, behaves like an inductor at high frequency, and then there's a series resonance or a zero in the, uh, you know, in, uh, in the middle. Parallel resonance, just the opposite, plus 20 dB per decade at low frequencies, uh, resonance, and then minus 20 dB per decade at high frequencies, okay? Uh, those, uh, those responses are, are gonna be uh, important here in just a minute when we look at uh, impedance, uh, PDN impedance. 
Also, the other thing is just a reminder of the way that high-frequency current behaves, right? Uh, we can't have current at high frequencies in a conductor, right? Uh, so what that means is if we take a look at just a simple, you know, uh, a simple example here, where if we have, uh, you know, we have a microstrip here, so we have current on the underside here, uh, the way that high-frequency current behaves, okay, now, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to roll out Maxwell's equations, right? <clears throat> All right? And show you how high frequency current behaves and give you a quiz at the end. All right? Now, when Duty saw those in the slides, he was just livid, okay? He said this. No, I'm kidding. He, he, I didn't put those in slides. No. <clears throat> Actually, the way that high frequency current behaves, yes, you have to satisfy all those max equations and electromagnetic boundary conditions, but it's actually much simpler than that. So basically, and to meet all those Maxwell's equation solutions, basically what, you, what we do is, is that the current and its return, okay, so the signal and its return, they're partners. They go together. They have to see each other. They can't look through metal, okay? Uh, and so, uh, so basically, uh, and this is going to be important when we talk about the inductance physics for, uh, for power integrity here, okay? So basically, if, you know, if we map this out here, uh, and if this is our reference plane, we go down, signal current here, and if we have, uh, you know, if we have an edge here, the edge is carried by displacement current, okay? Uh, signal return partner comes back through the via, okay, and then back to its source. Okay? Uh, and that's a legitimate return current, satisfies all the electromagnetic boundary conditions. Okay? And that'll be important in just a second because uh, the thing that I want to talk about, and the thing, you know, sort of the very clear, you know, mental picture that Stephen gave me, all right, uh, of these, uh, you know, of these uh, charge delivery physics that really changed the way that I think, thought about power integrity, uh, was, uh, was, um, uh, was relatively straightforward. So uh, just, uh, just one other, you know, sort of thing here is, is that uh, uh, when, we, uh, when we're delivering current uh, or charge for, uh, you know, for power integrity, whether we go from a low to a high transition or a high to a low transition, okay, um, whether we're talking about, you know, whether we're talking about I.O., we're talking about core currents, okay, um, we, you know, we have this problem here, and actually it's not a problem. We want to go fast, right? So going fast essentially entails... Uh, um, and, and also, we're not able to perfectly match, you know, sort of, in, and this is many of your business, right? Most of you, there's probably a large fraction of you here, uh, or most of you know much more about this than I do, but basically what we get here is sort of in addition to our load current, we get, you know, sort of the shoot-through current, people call it crowbar current or whatever you call it, okay? Uh, but we have to source both these currents, okay? So we have to source both the logic currents and we also have to source those shoot-through currents. And we'll see that when I give you an FPGA example uh, to talk about, you know, sort of why we use target impedance uh, here in just a minute. But we have to source both those currents, okay? Time to wake up. Okay. So, um, so the picture that Stephen gave me that was just sort of... Uh, because the thing that I was allowing to confuse me is just when I looked at how, you know, the geometric complexity in uh, uh, the geometric co complexity for, uh, uh, for uh, you know, typical printed circuit layout. I mean, the geometry is very complicated, okay? But the charge delivery physics are not, okay? All right, and so if we trace the current here, so let's just think about current coming from the decoupling capacitor, okay? Something switches, you know, the, the device, you know, the device is, uh, is drawing current, okay? So we come down the via here uh, to our power net area fill, across the power net area fill, and up to the IC, okay? And then we come back, remember here, as we come back on the vias, we have to see the return partner, right, and also, High frequency currents can't see through metal. Okay, metal is opaque to the high frequency currents, and it so com comes back and it comes back. Okay, and then we, you know, sort of we make our way back. You know, and current always has to flow in a loop, right? Okay, so we don't have to uh, just charge conservation. All right. So basically, what we have is this, you know, sort of those charge delivery or those, you know, or those current physics. That current path is relatively straightforward, right? And and with each piece of that current path, we have inductance, right? And really, we have just three pieces, 
of inductance you know, associated with this current path, right? We have the piece, piece of the current path getting from the package, or the IC or the package, down to the power net area fill, across the power net area fill, and then up to the decoupling capacitors, and of course, the return as well, right? Okay, that's relatively straightforward. That is not rocket science, right? Actually, my son works for ATK Orbital Sciences, uh, which uh, produces rockets. So uh, even my son can understand the rocket. My son is actually a real rocket scientist, and you know, but he didn't want to be an electrical engineer. Okay, but but even he can understand this. Okay, so um, uh, so so what we need to do is to sort of be able to you know be able to anticipate and quantify these pieces of inductance. All right, and all this laundry list of questions, sorry about this, I'm gonna back up here like this. This laundry list of questions, we're gonna relate that laundry list. Every question or every issue on that laundry list, we're gonna to relate to some piece of that inductance, right? That's not that complicated, all right? Um, the, the trouble that I had for so many years is I was letting the geometric complexity confuse me instead of looking at the physics, right? If I would have just thought about those, those, uh, you know, those uh, straightforward physics that uh, Stephen was describing to me, and also about the typical impedance that we see, okay, even among all that geometric complexity, okay, I very seldom, very seldom work with anybody or see anything that does not have this shape. This is actually from a 28-layer board. You know, the engineer wound up putting 43 coupling capacitors on here, and you'll see the shape of this power net area fill in just a, you know, in, in a little while in this presentation. But you see here, you know, we have this sort of very characteristic, and this is, you know, sort of the shape you saw from Heidi yesterday as well, right? At low frequency, we have the minus 20 dB per decade. I would call that a capacitor. Thank you. Okay, somebody knows their lines here. Okay. All right. Uh, let's try to get with the program out there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're sleeping, I don't want to wake you up yet, so, okay, no problem. So, and then here, you know, sort of we have 20 dB per decade, right? We call that an inductor, okay? We have a series resonance in between, right? Parallel resonance here, and then, you know, up at high frequencies, in series resonance, up at high frequencies, we have 20 dB per decade, and that's an inductor, all right? So then the question is, is which piece, which pieces? We can relate every piece, we can relate every piece of this to some piece of this geometry circuit, right? That's the strategy there. It's not that complicated, okay? Not nearly as complicated as, you know, sort of uh, getting lost in the geometry, and the geometry is complicated, okay? Uh, and, so, and so when we start to add decoupling capacitors, okay, every piece of this is, you know, is related to some piece of our, uh, you know, of our current path physics, as is when we start to, uh, you know, to uh, to add decoupling capacitors, okay? But the crux of the issue is, is this PDN impedance is relatively simple. Thousands of via segments, hundreds of decoupling capacitors, a complicated power net area fill. And this is what it comes down to, right? Uh, so that's sort of, you know, that's the, you know, that's going to be sort of the story here, okay? Now, okay? In the next 45 minutes, I'm going to repeat the same story about 10 different ways. Okay, so if you got that, now the time now is the time to get a quick nap. Okay, there's something important. Just same as always. Time to wake up now. Okay. All right. So here we go. All right. So you know, again, here if we you know sort of look at the same you know look at that sort of same picture, but now you know sort of we want to include the package here. Okay, so we go to the decap, down, across, up. You know, we go up on the package and then up to the IC. Okay, uh, you know, sort of it's the same, you know, we have the same story on the package as well, except for the package geometry is even more complicated. Okay, but the, the, the geometric complexity, the, the charge delivery physics are still the same. Okay, all right, <clears throat> okay. So again, here, you know, so that then the strategy, the design paradigm here, is, is then going to be basically many loops, small loops, okay? 
So, uh, you know, so many loops in parallel, you know, and small loops is going to be the, uh, uh, the design paradigm. Uh, and then over the course of, you know, sort of uh, uh, here, before break and then after break, uh, what I'll talk about is really breaking this up into, you know, into four pieces. Okay, actually, so the three pieces associated with the printed circuit board. So there's the piece here of getting from the, uh, from the IC package down to the PowerNet area fill, across to the PowerNet area fill, and then up to the decoupling capacitors, wherever the decoupling capacitors might be. Uh, and then also there's this piece that's what I'm going to just call above the board. So that's the piece that sort of is the interconnect on the board and actually connects to the decoupling capacitors. Because a vendor gives you, you know, sort of an ESL number. And, uh, and when, uh, when I uh, get to the point of suggesting some calculations, we're going to have to know, you know, what to do with that vendor ESL number, okay? So, you know, the vendor made some measurement in some way, shape, or form, okay? And, uh, you know, but, but we need to know what to do with it sort of in this, you know, you know, when we're doing our calculations here, okay? All right. So, uh, so, you know, so then here's the way things go, okay? So each of this, you know, sort of each piece of this is associated, of this current path is associated with some inductance, right? Okay? Now, what we want to do, the game here is, is that uh, as opposed to with the post layout tool, where we were essentially, you know, we made some changes, we looked at the impedance. Not, not good enough, you know, we rearranged the pieces. Again, you know, sort of we're, you know, we're doing this trial and error process. Because, you know, sort of the, the current path physics, charge delivery, is relatively straightforward, right? Even though the geometric complexity is not. The charge uh, delivery or current path physics are relatively straightforward. Then what we can do here <coughs> is, is that in our PDN curve, every piece of this PDN curve Okay, what I'm going to uh, be showing as we go along here, every piece of this PDN curve here is associated with some piece of the geometry. All right. So, for example, and I'll um, and I'll um, uh, continue to articulate this as as we go along. Uh, this piece of the geometry, the inductance associated with getting from the power net area or from the uh, IC or package to the power net area fill, that's this piece of the inductance right here. Okay, across the planes up to the decoupling capacitor. And back, that's this piece right here. The interplane capacitance uh, of our power net area fill, this piece right here. Low frequency decoupling, all these decoupling capacitors, this piece right here. Well, okay, if, uh, if, we, can, if we can associate every piece of this impedance curve with a piece of the geometry, um, in the frequency domain, every piece of this impedance curve is associated in the time domain with some functional variation in a time domain, okay? And, uh, and uh, uh, Heidi showed that uh, to us as well, right? Okay, so basically, if we can know, okay, sort of, you know, either on the printed circuit board, the package, or the IC, um, if we can measure, okay, and we can on the printed circuit board, we can measure sort of that time domain voltage spectrum, right? We can know which part of the spectrum is associated with which piece is the impedance curve? Which piece is the geometry? Pretty straightforward, right? Okay. All right. It, um, Clayton Paul, in his introduction to EMC book, on one of the front pages, I love this. Uh, I love this. Uh, uh, this, is, this is very classic Clayton. It says uh, in, uh, it, uh, he, Clayton writes, he said, for every problem, there's a simple answer, and most of them are wrong. Uh, and I, I love that because not everything is that easy, okay? And in most of your day jobs, you know, not much is very easy. So to tell you the truth, this looks too good to be true, okay? But we've worked with a lot of boards. And, um, you know, and I, I'm not making these physics up. I, you know, I, you know the, the physics really are these simple, uh, are this simple, even though, you know, even though I know that the geometric complexity is not, okay? All right, so why do we use target impedance? <clears throat> okay, so yesterday, uh, you know, Heidi identified that, you know, sort of our design, you know, is based, uh, you know, is based on the, you know, on, on the target impedance. I want to give you just a simple example of, uh, of why we do that. So this is just an, you know, FPGA example, okay? Uh, let me forget this slide, uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit too busy. 
So this is just an FPGA uh, example. It's a 14-layer board. You know, uh, the power, you know, uh, power net area fill, you know, for uh, that we were going to use was closer to the top. Okay, uh, and you know, and what I'm going to look at here is I'm going to look at the transfer impedance. Uh, one of these ports was close to the die. Okay, and basically, just as uh, 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 Heidi was saying yesterday, oftentimes what we'll do is we'll just remove de decoupling capacitors, right, and then solder to it with an open with a coax. Okay, it's a it's a, a nice, easy way and a good way uh, to make these kinds of measurements. Okay. So we programmed up this FPGA, okay, and you know, and we were able to get hooks into Quartus, all right, so that we could actually calculate the dynamic current, okay. Now, you know, sort of working with the, you know, working with a, uh, you know, with the vendor, um, and doing a dynamic current calculations. Yes. You said that you removed the decoupling, a decoupling capacitor, and then solve their coax, and then measure. Why do you remove the decap? Oh, because uh, you know we need you know we need terminals to uh, you know we need terminals to be able to uh, you know to measure onto the uh, uh, onto the uh, you know onto the power net right and so basically if we take you know decoupling capacitor off you know we can solder the outer shield of the coax you know usually we do this with semi rigid coax or you know there's some also mic remove the decoupling capacitor. Um, otherwise, if we don't, you know, basically what we're doing is, is we have that decoupling capacitor in parallel with what we're trying to measure, okay? And mostly we're gonna measure the decoupling capacitor. We don't wanna measure that. But is, isn't that part of your uh, PDN? Um, um, uh, it will be part of the PDN, yes, okay? As we see from the, uh, uh, as we see from the, uh, you know, for, for, for instance, if I have a, a, a nicer place to solder my coax, uh -huh. should I leave the, Oh sure, yeah. If you put special hooks in, you know, to you know to solder your uh, uh, to solder, or you know, if you actually you know put a you know put like a, a you know Molex or you know Rosenberg or you know one of those press fit you know connectors on here, that's better, okay? Because you can you know you can manage that a little bit better, and then essentially just measure the S21, uh, uh, yeah. and then uh, uh, and we measure S21 because then we don't have to deal with the serious parasitics of our probes, okay? But uh, just as uh, Heidi uh, articulated yesterday, but but that's why uh, you know that that's typical what we do to to make these measurements, and so we're going to make you know sort of the measurements uh, at you know here uh, ports you know S21 measurements again, but we're interested in the tra you know we're interested in the impedance here, so we were able to calculate you know sort of the you know the dynamic current here for uh, you know for this FPGA, and you know sort of uh, when you know here okay let me just back up you know when we have a, a clock you know as I said before you know there's still sort of this shoot through current that we have to source you see the clock when we toggle the logic the clock clock uh, changes uh, we toggle the logic and we get this big logic current yeah you get the idea here okay so so when we did this you know we programmed up the um, yes. Yeah. The switching current. Yeah. Yeah. And this is very special here to this FPGA, right? Um, so, um, so, and I'll comment on that here in just a couple of slides. In general, not going to be able to do this, right? That's sort of going to be my comment on the example. Okay, the example is going to be nice, neat, and pretty. Okay. If I seem proud of myself at that point, you know, I'll ask for applause, okay? But then the very next slide, I'm gonna say, well, unfortunately, we can't do this, okay? So, um, uh, so and, and that's where I'll be in just a minute. So, yeah, that's right, you know, calculate this dynamic current, okay? Uh, and then, uh, you know, and then, of course, we can, uh, you know, we can calculate because we, you know, calculate, we can both calculate because the tools are good, we develop our own tools, right? Okay, this is not rocket, you know, and, and those tools are not so complicated. They're mature at this stage. Um, but we can calculate and measure, okay, uh, both when we have, you know, sort of in here, we actually had the, you know, th this is, uh, you know, this is running, right? So, you know, so the, the whole thing is an active design. So here, you know, sort of we see here, you know, the, you know, the impedance here, low frequency. But then what we have here is we have a package die, you know, sort of package inductance die capacitance resonance here. It just pops up just a little bit, okay? Uh, and again, you know, sort of this is what uh, Heidi was talking about yesterday, but it pops up just a little bit. But 
But the dynamic current that we have, you know, with our FPGA, you know, sort of, you know, uh, uh, going along, uh, essentially this resonance is about 90 to 100 megahertz, about 100 megahertz here, and you see that, you know, sort of we ping, you know, in our, uh, you know, in our logic, we ping that current, and bang, you know, in the frequency domain, we get a big response there, right? It's like, it's like hitting a tuning fork, right? Bing! Okay. Yes. Yeah. This is uh, caused by the package. Are you able to see from the board itself? Um, we are, uh, right? Because that's going to, you know, sort of that, um, you know, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, if you look at sort of you know, an equivalent circuit, and I'll try to remember this as we go along, just to, you know, just to, you know, sort of remind, you know, why we see this. But we are able to see, you know, that system resonance. We're able to see, you know, at, you know, at various points, you know, including on the board. Okay, and so we see that both in the frequency domain, but if we do an inverse you know, Fourier transform, we also see it in the time domain. Okay, and we see you know sort of, and we see one of the spectral, you know, one of the spectral components that we see in the time domain is of course exactly at that frequency. Okay, and we see this on the board. These are just you know sort of you know our modeling and measurements. So then we put you know if you look at the scale here, we have a scale of you know 30 millivolts. You know we add decoupling capacitors. This is the point of decoupling capacitors, and uh, you know and you know and we can drive you know sort of that that noise voltage down, right? Okay. We model it. We measure it because we can calculate this dynamic current. We can't measure it, but because we can get hooks into quarters and all, you know, sort of the, you know, in the FPGA, the logic elements are all the same, you know, they characterize this silicon, yada, 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 okay, we can calculate that, all right? All right, so if the dynamic current draw is known, basically what we do is, is we, can take a, we can take a Fourier transform, that dynamic current draw, multiply it by an impedance, depending upon where we want to know the voltage, we can get the voltage in the frequency domain, do an inverse Fourier transform, we get the voltage in the time domain, right? Everything is neat and clean. The trouble is, okay, so basically what we have, uh, just a simple equation here, is, you know, impedance time the, you know, times that dynamic current, frequency domain, we get the noise voltage in the time domain. The trouble is, is in general, we cannot know that dynamic current. It's very difficult to know, okay? Now, uh, you know, there are commercial tools, for example, Apache, you know, makes a tool uh, where they, you know, where they estimate that current, right? Okay. Um, it, it's only that. It's sort of, you know, it's sort of an estimate because the ASICs are so complicated, okay? Um, companies like Intel and IBM, they will have their own internal tools, <clears throat> okay, and other companies as well. Again, sort of same story. They're only estimates. And oftentimes, you know, at the printed circuit board level, uh, we, you know, at the printed circuit and package uh, design level, we don't have access <coughs> to that information, okay? And in the absence <coughs> of access to that information, basically what we get from the silicon vendors is, is we get this target impedance, okay? And, uh, and it's that target impedance that we, that we wind up designing to. Turns out, it's kind of okay in the end. Yes. Uh, you say it's very hard to know this uh, kind of uh, current. Yeah. Um, this switching current. But is it possible to? Is there a way to measure it? This uh, switching. Current? Uh, so this switching current, not really. Uh, I mean, you know, we, you know, we can think about, uh, you know, we can think about. Well, suppose that we put a, you know, a small or a zero ohm resistance, you know, at a, you know, at a, you know, at a, a power pin, right? But when you have a large, you know, on, on a typical uh, large pin count ASIC, for example, I mean, some of the, you know, you know, 30 to 40 percent of the pins will be devoted to power, power return. Uh, and so, you know, on a large ASIC, this is going to be many, 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 many pins. And so, so in general, the answer to the question is it, not really. But if, if I use a device that has, let's say, only most of its current is drawn via one, uh, one pin. Then, okay, then, right, if most of it is drawn via one pin, okay, and, you know, and, and that might be the case if you have, you know, sort of a, you know, a small dual inline package or something like that, uh, then, okay, then, uh, you know, then you can think of a, you know, a few different strategies for measuring that current, yes, okay, but in general, you know, when we're talking about high, you know, sort of, you know, high, uh, you know, high pin count, uh, you know, BGAs or something like that, um, we're not going to be able to know that current, you know, 
<coughs> a either because you know sort of the vendors you know were the the information that the vendors have available to them you know no matter how good it is or how good it isn't you know we're not going to have access to in general okay uh, or you know or we just don't know it that well and so the alternative is really you know this target impedance okay now off you know typically this target impedance is just going to be given to us okay now where it comes from uh, uh, where it comes from you know is you know is an eclectic mix uh, of uh, you know of simulations you know, and ultimately it's re related to the noise voltage droop okay a DC kind of notion uh, and also ripple an AC notion uh, on the silicon okay uh, that will come to us from the silicon vendor and then what we're going to do is we're going to design our PDM impedance to that target impedance okay now Still, you know, we're still going to focus here, you know, still going to focus here on these three pieces, these three pieces of the inductance, okay, and, uh, you know, and meeting that target impedance by managing those three, piece of in, those three pieces of uh, inductance through our design choices, okay? Now, this concept of a target impedance isn't entirely satisfactory. We just don't have anything better, okay? All right. Okay, so um, uh, so uh, let me uh, let me talk just a little bit about PDN designed and with uh, multi-layer printed circuit boards with uh, power layer area fills. So just uh, uh, talk about you know layer stack up, adding the decoupling capacitors, and then you know sort of uh, an interconnect and value strategy. So let me give you sort of just uh, just an example, uh, which is. Uh, somewhat typical of the high, some of the high layer count boards that we work with, okay? So, you know, so here, this is a mini layer board, okay? The example that we used was actually a 44 layer board. Uh, and I, I wanna give you examples here where here, we're gonna look uh, at a matrix here, okay? And the matrix we're gonna put the, uh, in, one, uh, in, in one column, we're gonna put the power net area fill symmetrically in between the board, all right? In another column, we're going to put it at the top of the board near the IC package. And then in the third column, we're going to put it at the bottom of the board, away from the IC package. All right? Uh, in the rows, we're going to look at three locations for decoupling capacitors. Above the board, on the bottom of the board, and then connected to the, uh, uh, to the IC pins themselves. Okay, and that's going to sort of uh, give us, you know, that's going to, uh, to show us, uh, you know, sort of where each piece of this inductance uh, is associated with here, okay? So, if we take a look here uh, at, uh, you know, at, uh, at uh, the row where, uh, where we have, uh, you know, we've just put the decoupling capacitors connected on the bottom to the power net, or to the, uh, uh, to the power ground pins of our ASIC, okay? Uh, we put here the, uh, you know, the inductant, we put here the power net area fill on the bottom, in the middle, and then on the top, okay? And then we look at the PDN impedance, okay? At low frequency, they're all the same. In the middle frequency, they're all the same. Uh, but at high frequencies, if you look here, okay, at high frequencies, you see here at high frequencies, this, this piece of the PDN impedance is dominated by the geometry, by the piece of the current path of getting from the IC package down to the power net area fill, okay? And you see the lowest inductance has the smallest loops, right? It's up near the top, you know, smallest loop, okay? The same number of loops in parallel. Uh, next, uh, next is the, uh, you know, sort of when, the, you know, getting down to the power net area fill, uh, power net area fills in the middle of the planes, and then finally the highest inductance is at the top. Okay, all right. Uh, so question is, is why doesn't this change? Let's come back to that here uh, in just a minute. Okay. So next thing that uh, next thing that we want to take a look at here is is we want to take a look at uh, here when uh, uh, when we have here our power net area fill. Uh, uh, we want to look here. Uh, when our power net area fill here is, uh, uh, is, is, let me just, uh, give me just a second. Uh, we want to look at uh, here when our power net area fill here is, uh, you know, is in the middle, okay? 
Uh, when our power net area fill uh, here is, uh, is in the middle, okay, uh, and we put our decoupling capacitors here on the top, uh, uh, excuse me, we put our decoupling capacitors here on the top, put them on the bottom, uh, and then we also put them, you know, directly under the IC, okay, you see here that in all these cases here, okay, so this column goes with this figure, you see that in all of these cases here, at high frequencies, that inductance is all the same, right? Well, it's all the same because, uh, because the, the piece of the current path up, up in this frequency range is dominated, or, or this inductance is dominated by getting down from the IC to the power net area fill, okay? All right, it's the same in all three cases. All right, now, this power net area fill is in the middle of the board. Okay, so now we go down, across, and up. Okay, that is this. Uh, that is uh, that is this. Uh, uh, that is this black curve. Uh, excuse me. That's this blue curve. Okay, so uh, or, or red and blue curve. So we come down, across, and up, or we come down, down, across, and down, okay, because the decoupling capacitors here are the same distance away, all right, um, and because this power net area fill is in the middle of the board, those are the same two curves, right? There's the same two curves because the current paths are the same, current paths are the same, the inductance is the same, right? Okay. Um, here, though, that if we put them under the IC, that's a little bit better. Wait a minute. How, how can that be better? Let's see. I just, uh, it's all about the current path, right? Okay, let's see. I go down, over, and down, and of course back. Here, I only have to go down and back, right? Okay, so this down and up and that down and up are the same, but the difference in inductance between here and here is, is that piece of the inductance across the planes, right? Okay. Okay, it is, this is pretty straightforward, right? Relating sort of the current path, you know, and the geometry. Yes, please. Uh, could we go to the previous okay. slide? It seems that all the difference is in the <coughs> high frequencies about several hundreds of megahertz. In, in this case. case. In this case, okay. Yeah. And that's the distributed capacitance of the PCB. When I'm looking from the top into the PCB, I see this difference because of the distributed capacitance. No, no, you see this difference because the inductance getting down to that distributed capacitance is different. Okay, this is 20 dB per decade plus, right? right. That's inductance. Okay, Absolutely. go ahead. Uh, these high frequencies are typically marked by the package inductance. <coughs> so from a practical point of view, if you look from the die, these three cases don't really make a difference. Um, they do make a difference, okay? You're absolutely correct on what you said, okay? Uh, because basically what you just said is this, Wait a minute, if my curve is going to look like this, when I add that package and also the die capacitance, my curve is going to look like this. Yes, that's absolutely correct. And you say, wait a minute, if my curve looks like this, I don't care about that. But the truth of the matter is you, you do care about that. And the reason why you care about this is, is that, look, the path here, okay, so the path here is down, over, and up right? This piece of the path is this piece right here. So if I extend this down, and I'll show that in a, you know, in, in a few figures here uh, in just a moment. If I extend this down here, and I add decoupling capacitors, and I add decoupling capacitors, and I add decoupling capacitors, my limit of, uh, you know, of inductance, driving this down with decoupling capacitors, let me just go back up here. Um, I have a figure where I can show that. Sorry about the motion picture here. Okay. As I add decoupling capacitors, so this is one of, you know, this is a real board here, okay? So as I add decoupling capacitors, one decap, right? Okay, now take a look at this right here, this asymptote. I add one decoupling capacitor, okay? And then I add 19 decoupling capacitors. And I add 43 decoupling capacitors. Do you see that I am approaching this, this line right here, this asymptote is my limit, okay? If I get that too large, okay? And, and then, um, yeah, okay. yes, you're absolutely right. I was only talking about this slide. We don't have the capacitors, all the vias, all the damage itself. Mm -hmm. We don't have any other capacitors. 
only by big ones. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it really doesn't matter what happens at the very high frequencies because you don't have any more capacitors there. On your next slide, you add more capacitors there, and then the difference shows. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. So let me go back. Okay. All right. Uh, so. If we take a look here, uh, and then if we take a look at the case where, you know, sort of our inductance is going to be the lowest, okay, just to compare and contrast, all right, so we put the power planes close to the IC at the top, okay, and again, you know, sort of here, you know, at this high frequency, this is going to be our asymptote, this is the best we're going to do as we add decoupling capacitors, all right, uh, and then we take a look at the, the decoupling capacitors here. If we put them on the top of the board, we put them on the bottom board, or we put them directly under the IC, okay? If we put them on the top, we don't have very far to go down, across, and up. That's going to be minimal inductance. That's the red curve here, okay? We put them on the bottom, okay? We put them on the bottom, we go down, across, and then down. That's going to be the highest inductance. And then if we put them directly under the IC, that's going to be sort of mid-inductance. Okay? All right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and this is just kind of a summary of, you know, sort of what, you know, uh, what happens, you know, in, uh, you know in, in both the best and worst cases when you start to look at, you know, sort of combining them. But if, you know, it, then if we were to make a design guideline, okay, coming down with the stone tablets, right? I'm a university professor. Okay, I'm a very firm believer in being able to, having the right to stand up here and pontificate to you guys who actually have to do real designs and then going back to my university research lab, uh, you know, uh, free and clear. No, but really then, you know, sort of the design guideline and, you know, and, and you can never do this, right? You know, because basically signal integrity and routing is going to take priority and precedence, right? And so what layers we can have or assign are assigned for power integrity, we, we take, right? But if we could choose, the choice is fairly clear, right? Which layer would we choose? If the IC is on the top, we're going to choose, you know, one of the topmost layers, right, for, uh, you know, for our power net area fill because that's going to minimize, you know, sort of this high frequency inductance. And then as we add decoupling capacitors, we drive, you know, sort of, you know, we drive this mid-range inductance down as we add more and more decoupling capacitors to meet our target impedance, okay? All right, so this example that I keep showing you here is just from a 28-layer design, and here's what the power net area fill looks like, and, um, you know, in this uh, particular uh, device had, uh, you know, had 17 power pins and 43 ground, you know, ground pins surrounding it, <clears throat> okay? Uh, but basically here, you know, sort of as we, uh, uh, if we, you know, if we again, we're trying to relate geometry, sort of, sort of the circuit concept that goes along with it, the circuit that you have in your head, okay, uh, we're electrical engineers is, uh, after all, so trying to relate this sort of this geometry, the current path physics and the PDN and the circuit, okay, at low frequencies, we have our decoupling capacitors, right, the decoupling capacitors are comprised of sort of the, you know, the SMTs that we're going to put on the board, plus our interplane capacitance, all right? Uh, in this mid-frequency range, okay, we're going to have the part of the geometry which goes down to the power net area fill, across the power net area fill, up to the decoupling capacitors, okay? Uh, decoupling capacitors, wherever they are. <clears throat> um, and then at the high-frequency range, this is the piece of the... Uh, uh, this is the piece of the inductance from getting from the IC package down to the power net area fill. Okay? All right. Uh, and you see here, you know, this is, uh, this is a great example uh, where, and this was a very experienced designer here, okay? But you see here is, is that the asymptote here, this high, frequency, uh, this high frequency inductance associated with getting from the, power net, from the IC package to power net area fill, you see here, as we add more and more capacitors here, that that is this curve, if we extend this curve down right here, that that is the best we're going to do, okay? A good question is, is, you know, sort of what did we gain in going from 19 decoupling capacitors to 43 decoupling capacitors, 
Okay. Now, this wasn't an inexperienced designer, all right? But again, you know, so, uh, sort of just, you know, having an understanding of our, uh, uh, of our current path physics and how it relates to, uh, you know, to our PDN and also our layout is critical here. Yes, please. Um, can you go back to the previous slide with the... Wait, yes, this one. Okay. I see on the... We see that the LEQ is a summary of all those... Yes. It's all uh, inductance, but can you uh, say, talk about this uh, MIJ? Yeah, this mutual inductance, yeah. Um, so basically, you know, with this mutual inductance, I'll talk just a little bit more about that uh, in the, uh, you know, sort of in, you know, in the next installment here after break. Okay, but basically this mutual inductance is, is we have a lot of vias here. Um, you know, uh, vias that are associated with, uh, you know, with the decoupling capacitors, you know, and also vias that are associated with, uh, you know, the IC. And there's a lot of mutual inductance, you know, sort of among these vias and also among these vias. If we're smart, we can use that to our advantage. And I'll, I'll make some uh, suggestions on, uh, uh, on how to do that next time. Okay, in, in the next installment, yes. So the efficiency of the... <coughs> Top decoupling capacitor versus the bottom under IC uh -huh. decoupling capacitors, I guess, is highly dependent on the thickness of the board or how far the top decoupling capacitors from the IC, right? Okay, so let me go back. I, I, I think I understand your question. So the question is, is that um, you know that where I put the decoupling capacitor, uh, where I put the decoupling capacitors, whether I put them on the top, whether I put them on the bottom or whether I put them directly under the IC. I'm, just, I'm comparing be, between directly under the IC okay. and on the top, right? Uh, versus, versus on the top. top. Yes, so directly under the IC, the distance is the thickness of the board. That's right. right. And if you put them on the top, then you can put them maybe right nearby the IC, or if you have a socket or a heat sink, uh -huh. then you need to put them far away, farther uh -huh. away. So they are less effective, I guess. Well. Um, they could be okay if your power net, you know, if your power net area fill is in the middle, okay. So that here I go down and I have to go way over and I go back up, okay. Versus I have to go, you know, I go down all the way to the bottom and back, you know, the part if the power net area fill that's in the middle, the part that I avoid here, that piece of the inductance is going over on the power net area fill, right? Okay. However, if my power net area fill is closer to the top. Okay, then it becomes a trade-off of the incremental inductance to get all the way to the bottom versus going across the plane. Do you see? Yeah, I understand. Just if you can put the capacitors, I don't know, a few millimeters uh, from the IC, is it, how is it compares to the capacitors on the bottom? Okay. Um, so next, uh, uh, so next in Salmon, I'll actually do some of those calculations. Because it turns out that, uh, you know, that, uh, that we can do some pre-layout calculations that aren't too bad. And I'll do some, uh, some of those calculations next time. So when I forget your question, okay, uh, because, uh, you know, sort of I've hit that age where, and, and also I just got teenagers out of the house, so I blame my brain turning on to mush to them. But um, I'll try to address your question next installment. When I forget, remind me. Yes, please. And, and again, it's going to come down to, you know, sort of, you know, just think about, you know, if you want to do a simple rectangular loop inductance calculation where you have three rectangles, one rectangle going down to the power net area fill, the other rectangle going across, and then the other rectangle going up, versus doing the calculation of rectangle going all the way down to the bottom and back up, do that sort of mental rectangular loop calculation, or if you want, just get out your pencil, you know what the pitch is, do that calculation. And, and it will give you the answer to your question, not too terribly. Do you understand? It seems, no, it can't be that simple, can it? Next time, I, um, I'll try to convince you that, yeah, it can be that simple. The geometry isn't that simple. But what we have is we have a geometry that's just repeated, okay? And, um, and hopefully I can show you that next time. Okay. So uh, let me, uh, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end. Um, yes, please. What about the 
my, my adaptive equalizer isn't working too well here. And my hearing's not either. If you could speak a little louder, I'd appreciate it. Interleaving power plane with GND. A portion of the power plane, if you have the space. Uh -huh. Power ground, power ground, power ground. Uh, and, and, and using that parasitic capacitance that you get from the overlap in your PDN. That doesn't help you a lot, uh, because what happens is, is that, you know, because that's basically what a decoupling capacitor is, the multi-layer ceramic decoupling capacitor is, right? And so, you know, what happens is, is by the time that you get into that mid-frequency range, you know, sort of where, you know, where the, that mid-frequency range where your PCB, you know, and even a little bit higher package, you know, sort of design is, uh, uh, is, uh, is applicable, uh, what happens then is in that frequency range, it's really going to be the topmost layer that's going to be relevant in terms of the capacitance and the inductance, okay? And then at low frequencies, you know, sort of you have the, your decoupling, your SMT decoupling capacitors, right? So you've just wasted a lot of money and a lot of space with those layers on the printed circuit board, yeah. So uh, good idea, but, but, you know, but, the, you know, but the current path physics favors and do is dominated by that upper, you know, that layer closest to the, yeah. So let me end here, sort of just by talking about, you know, decoupling uh, capacitor strategy here, okay? So, um, so there are a couple of strategies running around. Oops, sorry about that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, question uh, regarding the, the number of capacitors and the uh, My question is, uh, when, you, when you change the amount of capacitors, the simulation, so you, you just multiply the amount of capacitors, or is it... Uh, oh, I like... Yeah, I like this. It turns out to be that easy. So, uh, uh, so what I'll show you next time, you know, with some calculations, is is that um, is is that you know, depending upon the uh, you know sort of the geometry you know that you choose for mounting your decoupling capacitors, essentially as you add decoupling capacitors, it just goes as one over n because they're in parallel. <clears throat> okay, uh, so it, you're exactly correct. Yeah. Um, now, depending upon how you mount your decoupling capacitors, that one over n can be more favorable or it can also be less favorable. And I'll show you maybe, you know, I'll give you a suggestion on how you might make it more favorable. But, uh, but it works exactly like you just said. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, just to finish up here, uh, is, is that there are a couple of approaches, you know, to, uh, you know, to decoupling capacitors. Is this, you know, sort of one, you know, one approach, uh, and, uh, you know, and people profess these two different approaches right, like a religion. Now, the good news is, it doesn't matter which religion you subscribe to, right? They'll both work, <clears throat> okay? So, one, uh, one religion uh, says that we're going to use an array of decoupling capacitors because we have to tune poles and zeros. That's okay, okay? It works, that's fine, all right? A little complicated, <clears throat> okay, but, uh, but it works just fine. Uh, the other, you know, sort of the other, uh, you know, philosophy says, well, use a large capacitor value in whatever package size you chose, 0603, 0402, 0201, or some other pepper spec, spec smaller, okay? Um, and, um, and, uh, um, and if you take a look at that, you know, you sort of take a look at, you know, sort of uh, two different strategies, okay? One strategy is, is, you know, sort of using this array of capacitors, that's strategy A. You know, and you use this array of capacitors, you know, three different values per decade, okay? Or you just say, look, let's just use all the same value, you know, the largest we can in a given packet size to get the overall inductance that we need to meet our target impedance, okay? Uh, and if you look at that here, you know, and I just, you know, kind of uh, draw a schematic of the target impedance here, is, is that the strategy of, you know, sort of using multiple values in any given decade, you see basically, you know, sort of we get all these poles and zeros, but with our current path physics, we cannot avoid, you know, sort of this basic minus 20 dB per decade, plus 20 dB per decade, uh, you know, uh, 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 current path physics. So. So both of those, uh, you know, both of those approaches will work just fine. The key here, though, is when you connect decoupling capacitors, is is that uh, typically, you know, sort of, uh, if you leave it to, you know, just the layout, you know, the layout people are just thinking, I just have to make a connection, right? You know, I have my bonding pads for the decoupling capacitor, and I just need vias that go down to, you know, sort of my power, my, 
you know, power return planes, power ground planes, right? And oftentimes, you know, what can happen is, is you know, you'll see, you know, sort of pieces of trace length there. Of course, that's bad, right? That just adds, you know, a piece of inductance that we can manage and that we can get rid of, okay? So ideally, you know, ideally, you know, sort of it's best, you know, it's, it's better to have those uh, vias right next to the bonding pads, okay? And if, uh, you know, sort of if the PCB fab house that you use, you know, sort of allows, you know, it allows uh, vias, you know, in, you know, in, you know, in the bonding pads, so much the better, okay? And you'll see why uh, as we, you know, talk about inductance calculations next time. And if you're on the package, okay? Um, uh, you know, to put, you know, to put multiple vias, you know, in the, you know, in the bonding pads on the package, if you're using a, a multi-terminal package or a multi-terminal uh, SMT device on the package, uh, putting those uh, vias in a certain array, you know, in, uh, uh, in, you know, in the, the bonding pad is better, okay? And the crux of the issue here is, is that, you know, when you avoid these traces, you see here, if you look at the power via, the power return via, if we have long traces here, we have a big separation between the power, power return vias, right? And that big separation is a bigger loop, right? We want small loops, many loops in parallel, yes. If, if I'm, uh, the, the lights are a little bit bright here. Uh, if I miss a question, just shout, hey, you. Uh, now, it'll take me just a minute if you do that. I'm going to think one of my sisters is in the audience. But once I recover from that, I'll, um, I'll answer your question. Yes, yes. Now the VR in the uh -huh. the question is, why do you choose to put the VR from the outer edge of the bed and not the bed? That's better. What you said is better. So the question is, is that, wait a minute, why are we putting the vias like this? Shouldn't I put this via right here, this via right here? Yep, I should. Yep, yeah. Okay, this just happened to be a test board that, uh, that, we, uh, that we built, and at the time, you know, sort of, uh, I, 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 I know more now, yeah. <laughs> Which is, yeah, right. <laughs> that's, that's code for, yep, there was another mistake learned from. Yes, please. Uh, Okay, did, did I? Uh, yes, please. Is that the same recommendation for a multi-terminal multi uh, component? So if you have a multi-terminal component, um, let's take this question offline. Okay, or actually, next time, so the next installment after break, um, when I start talking about decoupling capacitors and vias and things like that, ask this question again. It'll be easier to answer it, okay? Uh, because multi-terminal, you know, sort of, especially in the packages, multi-terminal capacitors are very common. And there's, there's a very optimal way to do it where you don't cut down on uh, routing flexibility, uh, but you use sort of maximum space that you have to, uh, to minimize that inductance of getting down and connecting to your power net area fill. Whether you're talking about on the printed circuit board, which people aren't going to do because it's multi-terminal device too expensive, but on the package you're going to do, you know, do typically. So, okay. So, uh, so I, I just sort of, you know, I made a laundry list here of, you know, sort of the design implications, okay? But this laundry list still comes down. You go down every, you know, sort of every, you know, every item in this laundry list here. And everything still comes down to small loops, many loops in parallel, okay? Uh, <clears throat> one thing that I did add here, uh, um, uh, yeah, let me just, uh, I, I guess I, uh, uh, one thing that I did add is if somebody asked about, oh, how far away should you, you know, put these decoupling capacitors? Uh, one thing that I did add here that's, that's not in your slides is, is that to sort of minimize if that inductance going across the power net area fill is a significant piece of the inductance, which often it is. You know, having the decoupling capacitors closer to the IC, as close as sort of routing flexibility will allow, is going to be better. And furthermore, it turns out that it is better, okay, you're not going to see this in any, you know, it turns out is, is it's better if you don't clump them in one spot. It's better if, you know, sort of you, you know, distribute them to the degree that you can around the periphery of the device, okay? That's about the only thing, you know, only caveat that, uh, that you haven't heard five times. 
At this stage, uh, let me end there. Okay, this is an appropriate place to end, uh, and we'll pick up then. Uh, we'll pick up then uh, after break, and actually sort of uh, show you, you know, sort of what the implications of, of this are with some uh, with some calculations. So, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, there were a couple of issues, you know, sort of a couple of questions over the break that people had that I want to come back uh, and I want to readdress just very briefly. And then I'll get on to uh, uh, to the you know to you know to to some calculations that are easy to do. Okay, um, uh, one comment had to do is look, you know when I'm uh, you know when I'm uh, you know when I when I add the package here. Okay, uh, uh, oops, shouldn't have done that. Uh, let me go back to this FPGA uh, this FPGA example. Uh, the comment was is that look, you know when I add the package uh, and the um, uh, uh, the package, you know, and the die, okay? So the package uh, inductance uh, is going to be dominate in any uh, on-chip uh, or on-package capacitor. And also add the die capacitance. Um, I don't see anything, okay? So that's what we have here for this FPGA example, right? I don't see anything above, you know, sort of 100 megahertz. All of that's dominated by what's happening on, you know, by what's happening on the die. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so why do I care about that inductance I keep showing, you know, at, uh, you know, at 500 megahertz? Okay, and I'll show you why in just a minute, all right? Um, the other issue that came up was, is, wait a minute, you're showing some high Q resonance. What I should have done is, is uh, and, and I'll go to that figure in just a second, is, is that, you know, in general, we don't have high Q resonances, you know, in any real system, okay? Uh, so this is, you know, this FPGA, this is a real board. These are measurements, you know, here. And you see here, yes, we can get resonances, but there are not those high Q things. Uh, it takes a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of effort to get some things that are high Q. Um, for this board that we were working with in the example that I showed, I should have really put the measurements here, you know, instead of, uh, instead of our simulations, because the simulations and the measurements measurements, you know, sort of lie on top of each other, except for at these resonances. Uh, and so my apologies, you know, sort of these resonances in the real board, you know, aren't nearly that high Q. And, uh, and so for, for, ignore them here, please. Okay. Now, uh, the, the, the other question was, just, look, you're plotting this, you know, above a gigahertz, 500 megahertz, and everything that's happening on the printed circuit board is happening, you know, sort of contributes to my power integrity solution, you know, in the, you know, in the kilohertz, you know, in the VRM, but for our, you know, decoupling, you know, is in the one to, you know, sort of, you know, 50, 100, at most 200 megahertz, right? Depending upon, you know, sort of what your power integrity solution looks like. So why do I care what's happening up here? Now, the reason why I care what's happening up here, because if you take a look at this example, and this is an experienced designer. This is a 28-layer board, uh, and basically, you know, sort of the designer, take a look at what happened here. Now, if I, um, if I extend this line down here, so this one right here, this is the piece of the inductance that goes from the package down to the power net area fill, right, and then back. That's this inductance here. And if I extend this down, 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 you see that it lies just a little bit below this curve right here, right? Now, as the designer added decoupling capacitors, one decoupling capacitor, 19, you see here that we're converging to this line right here. That's the best we can do, right? Okay, and we need to know what that number is. So if you say, well, I have 100 decoupling capacitors on now, I better add 100 more just in case, right? You need to know whether you've converged to that limit or not, okay? And so the only place that we can see that manifested is, is that, you know, these, and, and calculate that value. We need to be able to calculate that value, whether you're going to calculate it from the tool, okay, or you're going to calculate it from the PDN impedance. And the only place we can see it manifested is at these higher frequencies. And you see in this particular example, the designer put in 19 decoupling capacitors, just so happened to have room for 23 more, okay, added 23 more. Did that 23 decoupling capacitors do any good? Very, a little bit, very incremental, okay? And that's kind of the point here, so. All right, let me, uh, uh, let, let me move on here and show you, you know, calculations, some calculations uh, that we can do uh, in a, you know, in a pre-layout fashion. And a couple of you, uh, you know, sort of uh, last time, you know, some, uh, uh, 
uh, I think it was somebody over here, actually suggested the kinds of calculations that we can do. And when I was talking to you know, a couple of you over break, you're already doing calculations like this. You're doing them with the tool, but it turns out that you know, sort of we can do them in a pre-layout fashion you know, in a relatively simple and systematic way. And that's really what I want to, uh, uh, what I want to uh, 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 talk about. Um, I won't keep you from lunch, though, because I, the food is okay. <coughs> uh, and, uh, and I'm not one to miss a meal. So, um, so in general, okay, uh, the difference between, uh, and I should have, you know, I should have, you know, just used the measurements instead of the, you know, instead of the simulations. But the difference is, is the simulations, you know, are correct here here, because those are easy, because that's, you know, inductance calculations, right? <clears throat> the difference between the, the, the measurements and the modeling is in this queue. And usually sort of, I don't want to suggest that the queue is unimportant because it's those resonances that are going to bite us in a keister, right? Uh, but, um, uh, but, uh, uh, but, um, but, but those resonances are going to be dominated as often as not by subtle losses that, uh, that the tools are not going to capture often as well as we want. So, did, did that answer your question or no? I don't have a good answer. I don't have a good answer for you. Yeah, you know, the trouble with, you know, um, those resonances, you know, sort of is, is exactly, you know, sort of, and in, in, that's what Heidi articulated yesterday too, so, and, and you know well, you know, sort of exactly where the, uh, you know, where the potential for trouble arises. Um, but, uh, but in order to, uh, to do, in order to, uh, you know, to do those calculations well, we have to good, we have to have a pretty good assessment of loss, okay, and where that loss ha happens. And, um, you know, and we just, there's, there's not a good way to do that well outside of making a measurement, okay. <clears throat> um, and of course, you know, it's sort of until you have the hardware, you know, it's hard to make that measurement, and then, you know, and then th that's often too late. If you, uh, yeah, and I, I just, um, you know, I don't have a good answer for you, um, but uh, with regard to the measurement, if you want to just, you know, trap me sort of on the way to the coffee machine, you know, this afternoon, I'll make, uh, you know, make a suggestion. Turns out that the measurements aren't that hard to make. Uh, so, uh, act actually, they're, they're, they're easier than you would think. So. So uh, what I want to do is, is just <clears throat> give you some notion of the calculations, you know, calculations that you can make from a pre-layout, you know, in a pre-layout fashion, okay? Uh, now, you know, sort of um, uh, many, uh, many of you are already, you know, sort of doing post-layout analysis with the commercial tools, and the commercial tools are good, okay? Uh, they're mature, and by and large, you know, sort of when we use multiple tools, you know, even on, on, you know, things, you know, even on very complicated package geometries, usually the tools will come up within, you know, 20% and in, in, in typically better of each other, <clears throat> you know. And they should, really, because basically they're making the same assumptions, right? They're doing the, the you know, the Maxwell equations at Power SI, you know, Maxwell equations at Cadence are the same Maxwell equations at, uh, you know, at ANSYS, believe it or not, okay? So we only have, you know, sort of, and they're making the similar kinds of assumptions, okay? So the fact that, you know, sort of the tools, you know, will give, you know, sort of moderately good agreement with each other is, um, you know, is, um, you know, is no surprise. Uh, but when we're using the post layout tool, you know, oftentimes we're caught in this trial and error, uh, this trial and error rat race, and it would be good uh, you know, and it would be good if we could do just some, you know, some reasonable and meaningful uh, pre-layout calculations, uh, you know, to get us, uh, you know, to get us, you know, in, you know, in the ballpark uh, to eliminate some of the trial and error. Let me make some suggestions here, okay? So here's, you know, sort of, uh, you know, here's this laundry list of, uh, you know, of the you know, of design issues uh, that, uh, you know, that we have to deal with that I uh, had articulated uh, uh, last time, you know, in the categories of the power net, area fill, decoupling capacitors, and also what happens with the IC package, okay? 
Now, what we want to do is we want to do the calculations. Okay, this sort of, you know, reuse of a figure here <clears throat> is this what we want to do is this we want to do the calculations. We want to be able to do calculations for each piece. We want to do calculations for the, you know, for the uh, PCB or from the package down to the PowerNet area fill. Turns out that's pretty easy to do, okay? And somebody, I forgot who it was, somebody over here suggested, I think, you know, you, you, know, you suggest, oh, wait a minute, you know, we're just, you know, we're just going to do the calculation, uh, in, and I think you suggested this with, de with the decoupling capacitor. You said, well, if I can know the inductance for one decoupling capacitor is N of them, just one over N, N parallel capacitors, and, uh, and it turns out, yeah, you know, sort of, you know, and it turns out it works the same way for the, you know, for these pins, you know, getting down to the, now you can do a little bit better and I'll suggest a way to do that. So what we want to do is we want to calculate for each of these pieces down to the power net area fill across, okay, now here's sort of where things get just a little bit, a little bit sort of my design curves are incomplete for this, okay, so I thought we were going to get farther uh, than we did and we continue to do that, but anyway, I'll show you what we have and then, you know, and then here decoupling capacitors and then also what do you do with the vendor ESL? <clears throat> Turns out nothing, okay, but I'll show you maybe, uh, you know, but I'll make a suggestion uh, what you might do, okay? All right, uh, and, then, uh, and then after that, um, you know, by and large, uh, you know, we want to put together, uh, you know, a simple spice circuit, okay, that reflects these inductance physics, okay, we, we can't just make up something up, I'm not a real big fan of behavioral models unless we can avoid it, unless we cannot avoid it, but in this case we can, uh, so that the spice model is relatively simple, but it reflects these current path physics, all right, and then, depending upon, you know, sort of we were discussing, okay, what do you use for a, you know, for a current profile? Um, um, so, okay. All right. So, basically what we want to do here, then, is, is that each piece of this inductance, we want to be able to calculate each piece of this inductance, okay? And then we want to construct an equivalent circuit model. So, this equivalent circuit model, basically, this, this thing down here is exactly what I have up here. Okay, with the exception of the package and the die here is added. Uh, but, but here I put it on top of the geometry just to show that this very simple equivalent circuit model reflects the current path physics that I have here. Even though, again, the geometry is high complexity, okay, the current path physics is not. Um, and so uh, what we want to do is, is in, a, you know, in a relatively straightforward uh, uh, equivalent circuit model, we want to reflect these current path physics. And I drew the circuit on top of the geometry just sort of to, you know, to imprint, you know, in your, uh, in your thinking that, uh, you know, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence in the geometry and the circuit model. And between the circuit model and our impedance that we're going to calculate, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence, which means that we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between every piece of this impedance curve and our geometry, okay? And that's what we were discussing last time. This time, I want to just make some suggestions on how to do the calculations, okay? All right. So, you know, so the, the way that the de design approach, this pre-layout design approach is going to work then is, is that, you know, sort of we're going to start with this PCB IC, okay? So we're going to start with this piece of the inductance right here. We start with that piece of the inductance because even though sort of that manifest itself at a frequency range that's much higher than current is going to be drawn from the printed circuit board, okay, that if we extend this one down to low frequencies, that is our minimum possible inductance. So we can add a bazillion decoupling capacitors, but we will never get lower then, you know, in our 50 megahertz that we care about, we will never get lower than this inductance. So that's the reason why we care about, you know, about that, or that's the reason why that is how that inductance manifests itself, okay, in the frequency range that we care about. And right here is we're going to be add de adding decoupling capacitors right here, and that drives sort of, when we add decoupling capacitors, that drives the impedance in this range, which is our typical 10 to 50, 100 at most, 200, typically more towards 100 uh, megahertz down, okay? 
All right, so basically, you know, sort of just going to spend, uh, spend the, uh, uh, the next, um, you know, the next uh, 45 minutes just talking about those calculations, okay? The calculation, this LPCBIC, that's this piece of the calculation. The DCAP, that's this piece of the calculation. And then across the planes, a little bit flakier, okay? All right, but, but, but not... So you were talking about 50%. We'll get 50%. Actually, we'll get a little bit better than that. But, um, uh, but uh, um, uh, and then we'll also talk about, you know, sort of what to do with the vendor's number for ESL, because you've you got to deal with that too, okay? So, all right, so here we go. Uh, uh, so a student that was helping with me with this is Biao. Biao just extracted this piece of a geometry from a, you know, from a higher layer count board that we're working on for IBM. And so these numbers just sort of reflect you know, reflect something that we're currently working with and it was just convenient to do, excuse me. I'm sorry about that. So, uh, so, uh, so anyway, uh, it looks like, I think she, you know, she chose, you know, 16 layers here um, and the, uh, you know, and the stack up, you know, is just, you know, just reflected, you know, something that we're working with. And, you know, she put the power net area fill here on, you know, on layer six, okay? Okay, uh, so what we're going to do here, and, and, and for the calculations that uh, she, uh, she did, she used what, you know, what we're going to refer to as an alternating grid uh, power, uh, you know, power, ground, power, power return pattern uh, in the IC. Okay, even though I'll show calculations for other patterns as well. I think she used 32, you know, sort of 32 power, power return pins. Typically, there's going to be more ground pins than that. But, uh, um, and then she used a capacitor arrangement that, you know, sort of we're, we're going to call a doublet. And, uh, and I'll talk about uh, this a little bit more. And then when I talk about this doublet, uh, the, the person who asked the question about uh, on package for multi-terminal uh, multi devices, uh, that's, that's the point at which to, you know, sort of uh, to address that question again, so, all right. So let's talk about this, uh, you know, so this calculation, <clears throat> okay, this calculation where we're, you know, where we're going from the package down to the power net area fill, okay. Um, so typically there are about, uh, there are about five different geometries that, uh, you know, that will be used for the, uh, you know, for the power power return pins on a uh, on a you know on a package on an IC package, uh, um, um, it doesn't mean this is all inclusive, but this probably includes about you know 80 to 90 percent of what uh, what people do. You know, sort of they put them in a row, they'll alternate them. You know, this hex, you know, essentially, you know, this hex will have uh, you know will have them offset. Okay, and uh, you know, and then there's another hexagonal sort of, you know, there's another hexagonal cell uh, that will, so this hexagonal cell, you know, sort of offsets them, you know, here, two powers, then we'll jump down here, then we'll jump down here, uh, whereas this one sort of offsets them in a little bit different fashion. Uh, and then we have a grid approach. This grid approach is a little bit like this approach here, where we have power ground. But in this grid approach, oftentimes what people will do is as though they will also make sure that there are power return around the periphery of their uh, of their powers. Okay. So uh, we did calculations for a couple of uh, you know a couple of uh, standard pitch sizes, and we just uh, you know we just chose some drill sizes that were typical of the people that we work with. Okay, doesn't mean that your drill sizes might not be a little bit different, but, you know, but the inductances, you know, sort of, you know, you'll be able to interpolate just for the uh, uh, purpose of a calculation. You should be able to interpolate uh, here, okay? Uh, all right, now, now basically, you know, uh, there's only one Maxwell, you know, set of Max the Maxwell equations, right? Uh, the Maxwell equations in Rolla, Missouri are the same as the Maxwell equations in Silicon Valley. Same Maxwell equations here in Tel Aviv, okay? Now, uh, and basically, uh, how, you know, sort of, you know, what our approach to the solution is, um, whether, you know, sort of, uh, whether you use SI Wave, you know, PI Pro, whether you're using, uh, or, you know, or Power SI, we make the same kinds of assumptions, okay? But the critical thing is, is, is that if we sort of use uh, an analytical, you know, full wave solution that sort of, that, that was originally proposed for a microstrip patch antenna, what we see is, is that we see the inductance 
both the self and the mutual between all of these geometry segments is proportional to the thickness of is proportional to the thickness of the current segment between the two layers. Okay? So what that really means then is, is that we can calculate the vertical interconnect inductances, whether it's under the IC or whether it's from the decoupling capacitors. We can calculate it that as long as we know the via arrangement. We can calculate that on a per thickness, per layer thickness basis. Okay? And then if we're thicker, we just add up our thicknesses, we multiply by the thicknesses, we're done. Okay? Now, we have to do it for every, for every different via layout that we're going to have, right? Okay? So you propose, but if we stick to these sort of these standard layouts and we stick to sort of some standard, and you know, we stick to the standard pitch sizes, and we calculate them for a few drill sizes, okay? We can do those calculations. You can do those calculations yourself with your own tool if you want to. You can come up with the curves, the same set of curves uh, that, uh, you know, that might reflect your pitch sizes, your anti-pad sizes, okay? So doing your own pre-layout uh, uh, calculations, okay? And so what we do is, is we can calculate on a pre-layout, or we can calculate for a specific geometry, okay? So we calculate for, you know, for, for these different geometries. Um, and this one, uh, this one here is calculated, uh, 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 unfortunately it didn't say, uh, but this one right here is calculated for one millimeter pitch, okay? Now what we do is, is we calculate the first one, okay? And then if we start to add power ground pairs, we start to add power ground pairs. Basically, on a per pair, okay, this is power, but power and power return go together. As we add power and power return pins, you see this dashed line? It just goes as one over n. So we calculate the first one, and we add another pair, divided by two. We add another pair, divide by three. Yada, 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 you get the point, right? Okay, now for this unit cell, for this grid, where we are going to always ring the grid, periphery of the grid in a, uh, in a, you know, in a ground, you know, in, with ground vias, okay, that will establish, that one over n unit cell will establish our lower asymptote for this one, and then the one over n, most of the other uh, geometries just follow that one over n. So, the crux of the issue is, is we calculate that one point. We calculate the first one, and then as we add more, we just divide by n, okay? So basically, what I have here, you know, is, is I just tabulated here, okay, for, uh, you know, for a one millimeter pitch and a 0.8 millimeter pitch for these drill sizes, and then for those drill sizes, the, uh, uh, the anti-pad that goes uh, uh, along with these drill sizes uh, is in, you know, is in a uh, previous piece of the table, okay? We just pre-calculate that one over n, all right? And, you know, and depending upon what our drill size is, we pre-calculate that one over n, and as I add power ground pin pairs, I divide by n, okay? So in my case, we have 32, and so we're gonna divide by 32, okay? So what the calculation looks like this is, is this. Uh, suppose that we have a, a PDN target impedance uh, that's, uh, you know, that's a tenth, of an, a tenth of an ohm. And that tenth of an ohm, uh, people usually uh, establish from, uh, from a DC impedance. And so a tenth to, you know, sort of, you know, typical numbers will range from about a tenth to, uh, you know, to, to several ohms, okay? Our typical numbers uh, for this DC, depending upon the designs that you're, uh, that you're doing. Uh, and the frequency of the designs, you know, will, will be established, you know, here in this DC range, uh, and, then, uh, and, then, uh, and then we will go up at 20 dB per decade. <clears throat> so here, all right, uh, if we just, uh, you know, if we just take the calculations here, so, uh, uh, so here, if we have a tenth of an ohm, you know, at 200 megahertz then, our requirement for the inductance is about 80 picohenries. Okay. Now again, you know, sort of uh, one of the discussion, uh, you know, a discussion uh, uh, over break was this: 
this target impedance concept is absolute nonsense. Agreed. I don't want to argue that one. But it's what we get, and it's the best, you know, sort of it's, it's as well as we're going to do, uh, you, know, in the, you know, in the absence of, uh, you know, of having dynamic current profiles, okay? So anyway, so, uh, so then our requirement here, this high frequency requirement right here is 80 picohenries, okay? So, uh, um, so here, uh, if, uh, here if, I, if my uh, power layer here is on layer six, okay, I'm gonna add up all, you know, sort of all five, five, eight, and eight, 26, uh, 26 mils to sort of get down to this power layer. I'm not gonna add in that five mils, but 26 mils to get down to the power layer. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to use here, uh, uh, I'm going to use here, um, um, I'm going to use here sort of one millimeter pitch, 15 mil drill size, so that's 18 picohenries, okay? Uh, and so I multiply 18 by 26, right? Because that's the inductance on, you know, uh, 18 mils, 18 uh, picohenries per mil, 26 mils to get down there. So I have, uh, uh, so I have 468 mils, okay? I have uh, 32 pins, okay? So I divide uh, uh, 468 by 32, and I come up with 14, uh, with about 15 picohenries. So then I more than meet. So my 32 is, uh, is just the package that, I, uh, package that I chose. So I more than meet the, uh, you know, the inductance for, uh, you know, for this piece of the, uh, for this piece of the inductance profile, okay? All right. <clears throat> Okay, so the next piece is, is that, you know, but we have, uh, we have three more pieces, all right? Uh, and the three more pieces are, you know, are, you know, the three more pieces are the piece getting up to the decap from the power net area fill, getting across the power net area fill, and then also that portion that's associated with the decap, okay? Um, and so at this stage, uh, at this stage, um, we have to, uh, we have to we, I'm trying to think of a, uh, we have to guess. I was just trying to think of another word for saying guess, okay? Uh, but we have to, you know, do the best we can at assigning uh, inductance to each of those pieces, okay? If we get it wrong, we'll come back and we'll, you know, and we'll iterate, okay? And so, uh, uh, so the easiest thing is, and, and this is not an entirely bad thing to do, uh, both on the package uh, as well as on the PCB, typically, across this plane or across the power net area fill, that inductance and also, you know, if, if we're several layers down, uh, getting across and that, the inductance up to the decap will be about the same, okay? It's not gonna be a factor of two or three or four, okay? If, you know, if we're, uh, if we're a few layers into uh, the package or a few layers into the board, you know, it may be 20 or 30% different, okay? All right, so uh, so let's do the L, so let's do the decap calculation. Okay, now I'm going to show calculations. We're in the process of uh, you know we're in the process of, of picking out just some standard uh, standard geometries and standard package sizes. Even though I'll only show you a few here today, just because uh, we haven't completed the pre calculations for all of them. Okay, I'll show you three and I'll discuss three. Even though we're, you know, even though we're looking at, sorry about the motion picture here. I just want to go ahead here. Uh, even though we're looking at uh, here, that's not the way to do it then. Even though, uh, you know, sort of we're, what we're looking at here is, is we're, you know, sort of looking at, uh, uh, we're looking at the, you know, the pre-calculations. And again, you know, sort of you can do this yourself, you know, with your own tools, you know, even though we're looking at the pre-calculations here uh, for uh, you know, for nine different geometries, and uh, I'll uh, you know, and I'll discuss these nine different geometries here in just a little while. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, so what we're going to do is this: uh, we're going to do you know, sort of the calculations here associated with uh, with getting from the decoupling capacitor, okay, getting from the decoupling capacitor down to the power net area fill, okay, and just as somebody suggested previously. Okay, uh, it's going to work out just like it does with the, uh, you know, with the, uh, with the package, uh, you know, with the package pins. You know, we're going to get this one over n kind of behavior, which makes sense, right? Because as we add parallel current paths, okay, uh, inductors in parallel behave as one over n, right? 
Yes. Not neglecting, actually, in the calculations, not neglecting that mutual indebtedness. <coughs> We're calculating that mutual inductance. Uh, you, you, you saw curves. You didn't see any calculations. Um, but that divided by n includes a mutual inductance. So these calculations right here, you know, sort of we're actually doing full wave calculations. So you can do those calculations with your tool if you want, with your tool if you want as well. And so what you'll see as you add those, you know, as you add those pairs, you will see this behavior of one over n, and it includes that mutual inductance. Yeah. Okay. And the thing that that mutual inductance will do, uh, depending upon which one of these arrangements that you choose, that mutual inductance will be better or worse. Turns out. You know, it turns out that that mutual inductance is going to be best for this arrangement right here, okay? Even though, you know, sort of, you know, even though it's not so much better here, okay? Uh, even though here, this arrangement right here, even though this arrangement is not so much better than, you know, than the other arrangement, in particular as you get to high, you know, because here we only calculate up to 32, uh, even though as you get to higher, you know, pin count, they, it kind of converges. Okay, but, but the mutual inductance is included, yep. Okay, um, so when I say one over n, you know, sort of, and I calculate that first one, that first one includes that mutual inductance. As you said, we, we can't neglect that. And it's gonna be the same for our, you know, it's going to be the same, you know, for the decoupling capacitors as well, okay? So, uh, and, uh, and also, you know, the, the person who asked about uh, when you're uh, on package, when you're using uh, multi-terminal capacitors, that mutual inductance, uh, was that you? Yeah, okay, that mutual inductance, we can do it in a better fashion, and we can also do it in a worse fashion, and I'll try to suggest the better fashion here as well. Uh, because typically on, you know, uh, you know, on, you know, with those multi-terminal, you know, with those multi-terminal devices, you know, sort of, you're going to have, uh, uh, you're going to have quite a bit of area to put multiple vias, you know, in the, uh, you know, in, you know, in the bonding pad. So, I just want to show you, you know, sort of with this mutual inductance, you know, what difference this mutual in inductance makes if you, uh, if you do it, you know, sort of smartly, or if you do it unsmartly. Uh, okay, so I want to take a, a look at three different alignments. want to take a look at where you have the power pins are aligned, power pins are, power and ground pins alternate, okay, and then we'll also call this, you know, sort of a doublet, and uh, this, uh, this doublet was suggested by colleagues Bruce Archambault and Sam Connor at, um, uh, at, uh, at IBM. I started calling it, Bruce and Sam, you know, came up with this, and, and it turns out to be a good arrangement. I started calling it the BS layout. Uh, they didn't like it, all that. They didn't find much humor in that. So, so we call it the doublet now. But I, I thought that was pretty good, though. You know, Bruce Sam layout. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> that's as good as the jokes get. <laughs> this is the funny stuff here. <laughs> Not if you're getting this. Okay, we'll go on. Sorry. <clears throat> okay. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so my dad was a carpenter, so I grew up in the self help your dad on Saturday school of carpentry, right? Um, all my other jokes are not appropriate for this audience. <laughs> so that's it. That's all you're getting here. So, okay. Um, so, uh, uh, so uh, sort of these three arrangements, um, and we're going to do our calculations here. The calculations that I'll show you are for 0402, 0603, and 0805. Now, you know, sort of we, we, you know, we continue these calculations, and you can do these calculations with your own tool, okay? You don't have to take my numbers. You don't have to take my word for it, okay? Uh, it's easy enough for you to, you know, to do these. Just lay something out simple with your post layout tool, you know, and then do the calculations. Your Maxwell equations, same as my Maxwell equations, right? Okay, and, uh, and you will get the same thing. So, so um, now here, the mutual inductance, you know, associated with the, uh, you know, as you pointed out, the mutual inductance associated here with the pins, you know, on, you know, IC down to PowerNet, we, we included that. Um, also, this mutual inductance, because we're going to put the capacitors on in pairs, okay? And I'll show you why in just a minute. Uh, we include the mutual inductance between these vias here, but usually 
we cannot get our decoupling capacitors close enough to the IC, okay? Um, mostly because, because of routing at channels and even and also because of physics on a high layer count board, so that the mutual inductance between you know, these uh, uh, vias and also our uh, IC is neglected, okay? All right, okay, so we are, you know, when we, when we take a look at these arrangements here, let me back up here, um, okay, uh, I guess uh, Biao, Biao color-coded them. We are going to take a look, okay, we're gonna look at self-inductances, Okay, but then also all combinations of mutual inductances among four vias. All right, and depending upon how we do it, if we do it smartly, you know, or we do it unsmartly, this mutual inductance can help us or it can unhelp us. Okay, so uh, in, in here, just take a simple example uh, just to show you for this example, you know, the difference it can make. So if we have an 0201 package size, Okay, uh, and 0201 packet size, and you know here for the 0201, you know sort of we just use this, you know this particular layout, okay, for uh, uh, for our geometry, um, and if we take a look at you know sort of that uh, you know that package size, and we just do a calculation where we have this aligned, and this is a case where the mutual inductance adds. Oh, that's bad. Okay. Uh, versus if we look at the alternating where that mutual inductance has a negative sign for us that helps us or if we use the Bruce Sam or the doublet layout thank you very much there's a prize for you at the end see duty please so um, so uh, uh, anyway if you uh, if we look at the doublet layout where where we put those vias as close together as you know sort of typical manufacturing rules will allow us you see that you know, we can dramatically reduce the, the overall equivalent inductance for this pair uh, by utilizing that mutual inductance, okay? And so you say, wait a minute, you know, if I have this, you know, if I have this alternating, I wanna put all my capacitors on in a row. Well, not, not really, okay? Uh, first of all, for signal integrity routing, you know, nobody's gonna let you do that, <clears throat> okay? Because it's gonna cut down on routing channels, okay? But also, it turns out if you put them on, you know, sort of in pairs, um, and you put them around the periphery of your device, okay? Um, that, you know, sort of the, the loops to the pair, this loop, and I'll show you just in a minute in a picture, and this loop, you get mutual inductance between those two loops that's, that cancels, but if you put them here, that mutual inductance will add, okay? I'll show you that, uh, I think, in a minute. Okay, um, uh, so this just gives an example. You know, for this example, I just wanted to show, you know, sort of, if you calculate out each piece of these mutual inductances, you know, it's just sort of what those values can look like and how that can help you, okay? It's just an example, I wanna move on here. So just as uh, was suggested previously uh, in, in one of the questions, uh, you know, uh, last hour is is that well then the thing that we have to do is is if we calculate this first value and then we put these capacitors on in pairs we plot this on a log log plot what you see here is is that these curves are straight lines on a log log plot okay what that means then is is that it goes as one over n okay so now when we calculate the first one though as was previously pointed out, we need to be careful to make sure we get that mutual inductance calculation in there. And you see here that this green curve is if we, we put on a pair of capacitors that are separated, have no mutual inductance between them. That's that one over n line, okay? So you see here that if we, if we align them, we actually do worse than if we sort of just put them around along. Uh, but if we do the doublet here, you see, because in this 4V arrangement here, <clears throat> um, you see that we can do, um, you know, we can do uh, much, much better than if we put, uh, than if we put just N capacitors on there with no mutual inductance between them. Let me give you an example, okay? So if we take a look here, uh, 22 picohenries, so we're trying to achieve 22 picohenries, okay? Um, and if you look at the doublet, Okay, uh, so for the moment, uh, uh, you know, uh, you probably noticed already, say, wait a minute though, if I take a look at this bit of trace here, 
there's a penalty for that. There is, okay? We'll, we'll, we'll work on that in just a minute, okay? Uh, but if, uh, you know, if I take a look and, and I look at the doublet, I look at the alternating, and then I look at the aligned, and I look at just one over n, as if there's no mutual uh, inductance. You see here, to achieve 22 picohenries, that's this yellow line here, Bial blew it up here, 22 picohenries. You see, to, choose, to achieve 22 picohenries to get down to the power net area field on layer six, we only need eight doublet pairs. As opposed to if we have no mutual inductance at all, we don't, doesn't help us, doesn't hurt us, we wind up with 25 pairs. That's a, that's, that's, that's not a small difference, you know, in, you know, in capacitance, right? Uh, 16 versus, uh, you know, 16 versus 50 to achieve that, uh, you know, that 22, uh, 22 picohenries. So we can calculate, okay, for these nine, you know, for these nine different geometries that I'll show you in the layout, okay? I give calculations here only for these three because that's, that's, that's where we are right now. That's what, what I had finished when I... Uh, was making up these, uh, these slides. But if we do this, uh, if we calculate for this first number here, and then we start to add more, so we calculate that first number, you know, and if you don't like my geometries, go use your tool, calculate it for your geometries, and you're going to see it works out the same way, okay? You can, you know, you can do it with your own tool. Um, then if we calculate that first number and we add uh, and we add uh, uh, decoupling capacitors, we add them in pairs here, you see that we, it goes as this one over n from there, uh, and we've in that, in, in that first pair, we've already included the mutual inductance, okay? All right, <clears throat> okay, and here, uh, you know, in here, uh, I, uh, I give the, um, you know, give the, uh, you know, that first number here, for, you know, for the aligned, which you don't want to do, okay, I just put that there for an example. You see here, for the alternating, and then here for the doublet. And the reason why the doublet is the same for all the package sizes, okay, because these vias don't change, these vias are independent of package size, okay. We just cluster those vias as closely as we can together, okay, and as the package size changes, what changes is this, you know, sort of this this pad trace around them, okay? All right. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> uh, go ahead, yes. <clears throat> right. Do you remember, uh, it's a good question. So the question was, is that, wait a minute, so for the doublet, um, you know, for this doublet, there's a penalty here because of this trace. <clears throat> and so, uh, so the question was, is, is that, um, you know, why not, does it make sense maybe instead of putting these vias here, you know, to, to go and do the, uh, you know, for example, the alternating case, okay, the alternating case, but we put the vias in the pad. Okay. Now, remember, you know, sort of, you know, the rule is small loops. What's the smallest loop that we can get? <clears throat> okay. And, uh, you know, and also here, we're also trying to get mutual inductance to help us. So mutual inductance helps us when we alternate, you know, sort of our power, power return segments. Okay. <clears throat> um, and so the thing, the calculation that we're doing is, is we're trading off. You say, well, wait a minute. <clears throat> is you know, is the inductance that I save by putting those vias close together, <clears throat> is that going to be less than the additional inductance because of those, you know, sort of small but non-negligible traces? And, uh, and that trade-off will be is, is if your power layers are up close to the top of the board, then maybe the doublet makes less sense. Okay, and, uh, and my, uh, some colleagues from IBM, sorry about the motion picture, I just want to show it to you here. Some colleagues from IBM, you know, sort of, you know, uh, sort of suggested this shared pad, okay, that in that case, if your power layers are up towards the top, you know, then maybe the doublet doesn't make quite as much sense because now I don't really, I don't have a lot of inductance going down into the board and, and then I need to maybe think more carefully about what's happening 
you know, sort of as I connect to the capacitors. Do you understand? Did that make sense? Okay. All right, so let me go back here. <coughs> uh, let me go back. Sorry about this. Okay. So if we, uh, you know, sort of, so if we do the calculation here, <coughs> okay, and again, you know, sort of, you know, we're trying to achieve, you know, sort of a requirement where we get the, you know, LPCB decap, this part from the decap down to the, uh, down to the power net area fill. We're trying to get that, uh, uh, we're trying to get that uh, below 22 picohenries. So basically here, again, we have 26 mils, 5, 5, 8, and 8, 26 mils to get down there. Don't have to include the, uh, don't have to include the thickness of the, uh, uh, don't have to include the thickness of the, uh, of the metallizations. And the reasons why you don't is because basically, you know, when you go through that metallization, it looks like a little coax, right? You have a via through an antipad, that looks like a little coax. That inductance is much, much smaller, you know, sort of than, uh, that inductance is much, much smaller, right? That inductance is much, much smaller than sort of, you know, this inductance where you're looping around back and forth with a via a long way away. That's why we don't include that, okay? So basically, we have 26. We're going to use, we're going to go back to the table here for the doublet. Uh, 26 uh, mils, 6.1 picohenry per mil multiplied by 26, that's 159, okay? And so we're going to divide, uh, you know, we're going to divide, uh, you know, 159, uh, we're going to divide uh, 159 uh, to get, uh, you know, to get, we need uh, at least uh, 8 to get 22, uh, uh, to to get 22 picohenries, we're going to need at least eight decoupling capacitor pairs, you know, in this doublet arrangement. Okay? All right. So those calculations actually are pretty good, uh, pretty good, and, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, and, and reasonably reliable. Okay? So here's where things start to get a little bit more approximate. Okay? Calculating, calculating the inductance to go across the power net area fill, okay? Um, um, so we, uh, you know, we do those calculations. The calculation, and the calculations that I'll show you uh, are for, you know, sort of here is for a three-layer stack, okay? And I'll give you several geometries. But here, this calculation is more geometry dependent than the previous calculations. Previous calculations were easy, right? We have a few different layouts. We calculate for one, including all the mutuals, for those few different layouts, and then it goes as one over n. That's pretty easy. And also, it's pretty good. It works out. You know, it's just, that's the, just the way the Maxwell equation solution works out. Okay, here, the max, for the plane, the Maxwell equation solution doesn't work out so nice and neatly. And also, from the tool perspective, the tools don't do a real good job of giving you sort of this horizontal inductance either by itself. It's difficult to separate this out, okay? So, uh, so we're, you know, we're trying to develop design curves. And we're developing design curves here for a three-layer stack, for a two-layer stack, and then some asymmetric stacks. So what I'm going to give you here is just for this three-layer stack, all right? Uh, and so, um, and the calculations that I'm going to give you here are, you know, are calculations where, uh, where the, the current path to the decoupling capacitor is not interrupted by a slot. It's direct. It's not going around a corner or anything like that, okay? So in this previous geometry that I showed you, you know, the, the last hour, you know, for this 28-layer uh, design, it had a, you know, sort of strange area fill, okay? That was the case. You know, it had voids in it, but the voids were such that um, that it did not that those voids didn't significantly impact, you know, sort of the the plane inductance. Okay, all right. Um, but when we have something that sort of looks a little bit more like this, okay. So uh, in this particular geometry, the decoupling capacitors are mostly over here, okay. And then here, you know, this is just a high pin count, uh, you know, high pin count package. And then we have some, uh, you know, and then we have a void, you know, some slots cut in here for whatever reason. Um, for these kinds of geometries, you know, sort of the calculations that I'll show, 
you know, aren't going to be t typically, you know, very good. And then, uh, and then, and then we're, we're, we're working at doing something else, <clears throat> okay? Um, so, um, so here, uh, basically, you know, sort of what we have here is this, uh, okay, time to wake up. <clears throat> uh, so one thing that I didn't, uh, uh, that I didn't articulate, uh, uh, articulate uh, uh, too, uh, too significantly uh, last hour was is that when you're putting on decoupling capacitors, okay, or decoupling capacitor pairs, all right, um, if we put the decoupling capacitors, now here Biao shows this symmetrically, they don't have to be symmetric, okay, um, but if you put these decoupling capacitors on in a fashion where you're not clumping them all on one side, okay, if you have decoupling capacitors that you put, you know, sort of you put it here, you put it here, you know, here, that you kind of think about distributing them in a kind of more or less, you know, symmetric fashion. If you do that, okay, basically what you have here is you have a loop here, right, and you have a loop here, and the mutual inductance between those loops is negative, okay, as opposed to if you put uh, if you put one here, and then you put something right next to it, that mutual inductance adds. So then you say, oh, I put two loops in parallel. I just divide by two. No, you don't, because that mutual inductance added there. It's not as good as dividing by two, okay? And so, um, uh, so I, I didn't articulate this very well, you know, last hour. Uh, but, uh, you know, but when you're putting the decoupling capacitors on, if you think about putting them, you know, sort of, uh, this isn't, you know, put them in a symmetric fashion, okay, coming down from the head. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, you know, sort of roughly, you know, don't clump, you know, don't clump them up. It doesn't mean, uh, doesn't mean that, that that's not going to happen because you don't have any flexibility, but it's better if you sort of use that, uh, uh, you know, use uh, the mutual inductance to help you here, okay? All right, so, uh, so what happens with the plane? And I'm just going to, uh, in, a, in here, I'm going to give, you know, just sort of the, um, uh, going to give uh, the trends here, is, is that um, here, you know, because of this, as you add decoupling capacitors, you're adding more parallel paths across that area fill, right? More parallel paths reduces the inductance, okay? So as you add decoupling capacitors here, okay, the curve here, as you add, you know, when you start to put one decoupling capacitor on, okay, versus as you add decoupling capacitors, decoupling capacitor pairs, you decrease, you know, sort of we're decreasing the inductance, right? Okay? Now, as we add more power ground pin pairs, Okay, so here, as we add more power ground pin pairs for a capacitor, we essentially are spreading the current here as we go out, okay, spreading the current here as we go out, and so we're going to get a lower inductance. So basically our curves are, as we add decoupling capacitor pairs, or as we add, you know, or as we add sort of area because we have more power ground pins pairs in our IC. Uh, we're going to, because of those additional, the wider current distribution with power ground pin pairs and the additional paths, we're going to, uh, and if we put them on in this fashion, you know, in this fashion where, you know, sort of we get mutual inductance to help us, we're going to drive down our inductance, okay? Now, I give, you know, I give some, uh, you know, some design curves just to give you numbers here, okay? Some design curves for dis different layer stack ups number of pairs, number of ICs, just so that you can put some numbers on these. But I'm not going to go through these curves uh, because, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, because the curves are very specific to sort of this geometry. And I give here, you know, sort of, you know, three, uh, three thicknesses, you know, sort of uh, five, you know, two and a half mil, you know, and also 10 mil thicknesses, just to give you an idea of what those inductances are as we add decoupling capacitor pairs, as we have more power ground IC, pin, uh, uh, IC pins, so that there's at least enough of a family of curves there that you can roughly, 
put a, you know, you know, put a, you know, associate a number with your own design. It's not going to be terrible. It's not going to be sort of great either, okay? All right. Yes? So the difference between the charts is this, okay? So what these charts are is, is that we have this three-layer stack up, okay? Um, and this three-layer stack up is um, uh, this three-layer stack up here. Uh, in this case, you know, five mil separation here, okay? Um, here, the curves here, we have this D, the distance, okay, for these decoupling capacitors. This distance here is half an inch, 500 mils, 1,000 mils, 1,500 mils, okay? Uh, and, uh, um, and then also, the family of curves are for eight power ground pin pairs, 16, 32, okay? And mostly what I'm trying to give you is enough curves here so you could get a sense of how, you know, how, what, this induct, what this inductance trend looks like so that for your own designs, there's enough curves here where you can put, well, that's not my design, but I'm roughly here. You can put a number on it. Okay. You're assuming around that's correct. I'm assuming, you know, assuming the capacitors are sprinkled, you know, sort of around the chip so that as we add as we add the capacitor pairs, and they're put on in pairs, okay? As we add the capacitor pairs, and they're putting on, put on as doublets, okay? That, you know, sort of that we're getting, you know, okay, we have two pairs, we have four pairs, that we're getting that mutual inductance to help us. There was a question over here? Yes. when you have a like this, put the capacitors right I think that's what most people do. They put the capacitor right under. So this whole distance thing is not so relevant. Um. Um, it's relevant uh, again. You know, remember our uh, you know our our strategy or our physics. Okay. You know, has to do with loop, right? <clears throat> okay. So if I, you know, if I have a board where the inductance associated with going all the, you know, all the way to the bottom and back up, you know, is less than you know, sort of going to the middle out and then back up and back, then yes, that's the way that we want to do it. Also, that has the advantage what you're suggesting, and 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 no, most people don't do that. You may do that, okay, but but. In, in your designs, but, uh, but depending upon what people's designs are, they, may, they choose to do something different. Now, what you're doing has the advantage of you don't cut down on routing channels. And often the reasons why people will do it, if for no other reason, is exactly that reason. But you can imagine the other case where if we go, you know, if you, if you have, you know, an 18 layer board, you go down 18 layers, but your power net area fill is up near the top. And I go down, there's almost no inductance there. I go over, okay, I'm collecting inductance there, and I go back up. It's very easy for that to be less than what you just suggested, okay? So, uh, so it, 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 you know, again, you know, sort of, you know, there's value, you know, there's value in being able to do the inductance calculations in a pre-layout fashion, okay? <clears throat> or even a, in a post-layout with the tool so that you can put, put numbers on each piece of this inductance so you can decide that I want to do this. This is best for my layout and my design. Or, or you say, no, it's not best, but I need those routing channels, so this is what I'm going to do. So let me finish up here, <clears throat> okay? Last thing I want to talk about is this sort of this, this final piece of the calculation where, uh, you know, what to do with uh, the ESL of the part, okay? Uh, because, uh, you know, sort of the vendor, you know, gives you a data sheet, <clears throat> okay, and, uh, you know, and, and, and you want to know what to do, you know, with that number, okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, um, so what we want to do here <clears throat> is, is, that, um, is, is that the calculations that I give, have given you, so to the previous calculations, <clears throat> um, are for, because basically we need a, a port. So even if you do those calculations yourself with your tool, Power SI, SI Pro, SI Wave, you can do the same calculations. You're going to get my same numbers, right? Because you same Maxwell equations, okay? Um, but, the, but you need a port. So basically what you do is, is we're going from this power layer down, okay? Or the ground, the, you know, the topmost ground down. So we still have this piece of the loop 
above and then through the device and then back. Okay? And we need to do those calculations as well. Okay? And we just did those calculations with, uh, you know, with, you know, with CST. Okay? Now, when you look at something like the doublet, okay, we have all these current segments. We have all the self and the mutual and the yada, yada, yada. Complicated. Okay, but uh, you know, but we can use you know sort of you know we can combine inductances. Okay, you, you, if you remember back to your formal education, you know sort of this is the thing that we did. Okay, we combine all these inductances, and what we really want is is we want just one number. Okay, so just to use the network reduction, uh, and we get one number for this L above. Now, we have to calculate here <clears throat> this piece of the inductance as if we short out these bonding pads. And then we also have to calculate sort of the inductance of the current path through all those layers in the multi-layer ceramic capacitor. Okay? All right. Uh, and so, so what we did here is this, uh, so I'll only show you curves sort of for these first three, which is because right now we're working out all the other examples. Okay? Um, and, and here we're assuming, so, oops, so, here, you know, sort of this, uh, you know, oh, excuse me, not the first three. Uh, we're going to do it for the, you know, for the power via aligned and alternating, and then also for the doublet. But there are other, you know, other geometries that we're working out as well, including three terminal capacitor. Uh, and one of my colleagues from IBM, you know, suggested, oh, you know, if you're going to add, you know, if you're going to do this doublet, maybe you can add a few more vias. Uh, who asked, uh, was it you that asked about the, uh, the multi-terminal uh, capacitor? Okay, so. Is this your question now? No, I have another one. Oh, no, you only get one question. Which one do you want? <laughs> Old question or this one? Uh, no, okay, this on. one. <laughs> I'll take one. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, do you want to lend him your question then? No, we, we are aligned. We have the same question. Oh, okay. All right. So you get two questions now. Please thank your colleague. If, uh, going back to the previous slide with the doublet geometry. This, the, yes, this, this one right here? Yeah. Um, Will you get the same effect of this mutual cancel cancellation if those capacitors come from different power domains? No. No. Uh, uh, no, you won't. And so, you know, so to hear, actually, this is a good question. Here, I'm only talking about one power domain, uh, one power net. But addition to this question, you are always talking... Okay, are we on three questions here or just... No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You are talking always about uh, digital circuits with like a big plane of uh, power. Uh huh. Or, or it doesn't have to be a big plane, just an area fill. And, okay, but you know, on, on RF design, we usually don't use planes. We use like a, like a tree, like a tree. Uh, all, uh, even if it's the same uh -huh. branch, even if, if it is the same power rail, let's say 1.8. But you have few customers, then we use like different branch to each one of them, right. in order to avoid some, some noise going between the PA, for example, to the right. RX. Yep. So in this case, when you have like branch and you have decap for each one separately, does it still go this method? No. So this one is, you know, sort of this. That's a. So you know, sort of there. Are, there are two threads here. Okay. The thread that you know, sort of that I've been talking about for the you know for the last hour and this hour is is that we're talking about power net area fills, not complete planes, but area fills. Okay, and sometimes area fills can be pretty small, right? But the area fill includes the chip, includes the you know sort of the chip, and also the area fill includes you know sort of the current path out to the capacitors. Okay, that's even though the area fill can have strange shapes, that's you know sort of that's that's what I'm talking about. When you go, when you start to put things out on a trace, <clears throat> different, you know, different approach. Okay? Was that your question? Yeah, and you are not covering this different approach? We are not, you know, sort of uh, come next time, you know, sort of that's twice the price for that, uh, that theory. Because it's harder, it's twice as hard. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm getting hungry here, so a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, open loop here, so my apologies, okay? Back to your uh, uh, back to your question here. Uh, when you have um, you know when you have uh, multi-terminal you know sort of multi and this is very common on packages, right? Uh, because one of the designs that we're working right now with right now uses the the the, uh, the low uh, inductance uh, you know low inductance capacitors. So instead of being 0, 0603, it's an 0306 part. Okay. 
And then, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you use, you know, in your, uh, you know, in your bonding pads, if you're smart, you know, about the way that you do your vias in your bonding pads, so that you get this alternating, if you get this alternating pattern between power and ground, and put, and then fill, you know, to the degree that you can, your bonding pads uh, with this, uh, you know, with this power and ground. Um, uh, that's as good as you can do with, uh, you know, with using that mutual inductance and minimizing the overall interconnect of that inductance uh, associated with that package. It can dramatically lower that inductance. And if you want to talk a little bit more about it, just you know, maybe you know, before we go, actually try to catch me as I'm racing to the chow line. No, I'm kidding, just after, after this, okay? All right, so basically, you know, sort of what we're doing here is this, you know, sort of, we're just going to do the calculation, and we just do these calculations with CST, okay? You can generate the same curves yourself, okay? But here, depending upon, you know, depending upon, you know, sort of what this layer thickness is, you know, you're going to have more inductance, you're going to have less inductance there, okay? All right? So what we do is, is, you know, we short this out, and we do the calculation for that, and you say, okay, well, what do you do now for the ESL of the package? It turns out, Tools like CST and you know and and uh, you know and other full wave tools, it turns out that we have enough computational horsepower that we can model capacitor packages. Why ever in the world you'd want to do that, I don't know, but we do. Well, actually we do, and there's a reason why we do. But it turns out here, okay, okay. So we generate the curves here, okay. We generate the curves for 04, 206, 03, 08, you know, 08, 05, okay. Uh, and I give the geometries here for generating those curves, all right? Um, but now what we need to do, so I'm just gonna go through this, you can look at the curves, but now what we need to do is, is we put, a, you know, above here, we also put this package, this SMT package on here. It turns out, it turns out that it, that it is as simple, uh, in, in the way that we did this was we just, again, modeled the capacitors, we did some measurements, Okay. It turns out that you can just use a rectangular loop formula okay, for this, this piece of the current path. So this is in the curves. Okay. We de develop these curves uh, from CST. And then what we do is, is we just add to those curves this, not this height, but one half that height. And we use the same curves back here. We just add one half the height of our SMT, and it turns out to be, you know, sort of, you know, when we do the, uh, you know, when we do the CST, uh, you know, when we do the CST modeling and we do the measurements, it turns out that turns out to be good enough. And you know, and then what? And then we can avoid the worry of, wait a minute, what do I do with the vendor's ESL number? Because the vendor's ESL number was measured with a specific fixture, right? The vendor's fixture is not your, is not your printed circuit board, right? Your printed circuit board are these, you know, sort of, your printed circuit board is this, okay? And so basically, it turns out, you know, it turns out that we just sort of use half the height of the SMT, and that comes within, you know, within a few percent of actually, you know, sort of, you know, of actually, you know, of actually, uh, of actually calculating that inductance as it pertains to the way that we're using it on our printed circuit board. Otherwise, you know, sort of, we can't know what the vendor's fixture is. I mean, um, I trust the vendor's data sheet is giving me what the vendor measured. I just don't know what that is, and I don't know how it pertains to sort of the way that, that I'm going to use the part. Yes? No, no, not going to use it. I mean, because I don't know how to use it, because I don't know how they measured it, right? So, so that, you know, as we were, you know, as we were developing sort of this pre-layout approach, you know, our, uh, you know, our, you know, part of our angst was just to try to figure out you know, what we were supposed to do with that number, and it turns out we're not going to do anything with that number, okay? You know, we actually did the SEM cross-sectioning, you know, measuring, studying capacitors, the CST, blah, 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 
And it turned out it was as simple as just using half the height, adding the half the height you know, to these design curves, and that turned out to be much better than we would have ever expected. Okay? And, and in part because these current path physics are pretty straightforward again. All right. So let me finish up here is, is that, okay, how to put this all together, you know, sort of in the equivalent, you know, in this circuit model, okay? So basically our geometry here, so our geometry here is, is we have sort of three pieces, piece getting from the package down to the power net area fill, across the power net area fill, up to the, you know, uh, decoupling capacitor, and then also we need sort of a piece of inductance associated with above the board and the decoupling capacitor, right? Okay. Now, the thing that you will notice here is, is that here, I didn't give any sort of curves here. We're still generating the curves for if you, uh, you know, if you put, uh, if you put the, uh, uh, the, the SMT, the decoupling capacitors, you know, across the IC pins. We're still working at developing those, uh, those curves. Um, and that has, uh, again, that has the benefit, even if that inductance isn't sort of minimal inductance for your stack up has a benefit is, you know, you don't sacrifice any routing channels uh, for that. So, so um, you know, so I guess the penalty for doing that, if you put on additional decoupling capacitors, the only penalty is, is you have another part, okay, in the machine time and, the, you know, in the cost of that part. But so here we have our, you know, we have our circuit model here, okay, and that circuit model, essentially, I, I take this circuit model, because it's not easy to see in this geometry, and I redraw this circuit model, I add in the package inductance and the die capacitance, okay, um, and what I come up with here is, is this LPCB EQ here is essentially the PCB decap, that's sort of all the decoupling capacitors, Okay, it's the piece above, all of those pieces above, and then the piece across the plane, that's this one, the decoupling capacitors, okay, this C plane is just the capacitance of the power net area fill, that's a parallel plate formula, right? Okay, and, and that parallel plate formula works out just fine, okay. Now here, the thing that we don't have a good handle on is this sort of what kind of losses should we put in, and basically sort of the example that, you know, that I give you in a slide is just, you know, the designs that we work with are roughly in this range, okay? Uh, uh, and that was, a, you know, that was, there was a question over here that had to do with, uh, that had to do with losses, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and I had, didn't have a good answer, you know, 30 minutes ago, and I don't have a good answer now either. And so, you know, just, it's just based on our experience, you know, uh, what we put in there. Um, and, um, and what I tried to do then is this, you know, sort of basically, uh, basically then if you look, you know, sort of at, uh, you know, at each piece of this curve here, okay? You know, I've color coded, you know, sort of the curve, the geometry we can match in a one-to-one -one fashion. And typically the geometry, the frequency range that we're interested in is this frequency range right here where our decoupling capacitor, you know, sort of where our decoupling capacitor uh, layout and adding decoupling capacitors is going to impact, okay? Uh, this, you know, sort of we add our decoupling capacitors, impacts this piece of the curve, which is associated with, you know, with this part of our printed circuit diagram, okay? Okay. So, uh, so this, uh, uh, this turns out, I, I have, you know, there's a few additional slides here, but this turns out to, uh, to be a good place to stop uh, in, because it's lunchtime, no. Turns out to be a good place to stop uh, and see if there are any questions here. Yes? Could you please uh, elaborate uh, regarding the inductance edit due to the ESL of the capacitor? What do you about the half time and the design curve? How do I know what is the ESL for the thermal package? We're not using the ESL at all. And basically, what we're doing here, let me go back and see if I can do a better job here. <clears throat> so, these design curves, okay, so here we have a design curve, okay, and these design curves here, we have this distance. Um, and this, let me get a better, uh, and here we do it, uh, let me do, look at the doublet. Okay, here's for the doublet. Okay. 
Uh, and for this doublet, okay, I give all the geometries here for, you know, sort of the traces, okay, because this is the part now, not the vias, but the part that's sort of, the part that is from the top ground plane above and then through this distance, okay? So I do these calculations, okay, do these calculations, and I extract an inductance, okay? This in includes all the mutuals of a little segment and then those traces, okay? All the mutuals of, you know, sort of this, this arrangement, all right? Um, and here, this is a short here, okay? So don't include the, you know, don't include the SMT yet, all right? So as a function, Okay, for in, in here, for 0805, 0603, 0402, as a function of this distance here, we, we give the curve here, but, but also here are the values, the inductance values, so you don't have to try to pull it off the curve. Okay? So as a function, you know, sort of as I go up, you know, that top, that thickness of the board above the topmost ground plane, as, I, as that gets thicker, 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 okay, thicker, 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 for my package size, I just pull off that inductance, okay? Okay, now what to do about my part, okay? Well, what to do about the part, I'm, I'm not gonna do anything with the vendor's ESL number, because, because, right, okay? But it turns out, when we do the calculations, we, S, you know, we do the, the SEM cross-sections, we model, we gin it up in CST, and we compute for a half a day or one day on our parallel blah, blah, blah. All those layers, and we extract the inductance, it turns out if we just add one half of H, okay, so if the thickness of the SMT is H, if we just add one half of H to this D, we use that number, we make an error that's less than 10%. Actually, much less than 10%. And you think, after all that, after all that complicated, we gin up this powerful numerical tool, we go to the effort of cross-sectioning it and things like that, that's what you come up with? And yes, it is. Yeah, I mean, and, and, then, and then I don't have to do anything with the vendor's number because I don't know what to do with it. And that's why we went to all this effort because I don't know what to do this number. So yes, we got to do the SM. We did a lot of, you know, SEM, scanning electron microscope, you know, cross sections, a lot of CST simulations, and this is, you know, and this is the outcome. Turns out to be this straightforward, yes. <laughs> they are, yeah, multi-layer ceramic capacitor. What's that? How relevant are they for other uh, you know, for example, so these were just the, uh, you know, the standard multi-layer ceramic capacitor, MLCCs. Um, you know, if we're looking at, you know, sort of the low inductance capacitors, um, I, I don't know, you know, sort of. And, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking probably the same, but I don't know. And I don't have enough confidence to say probably the same until we go through all the effort and then we come up with, oh, you know, yeah. But, but I don't really know. Um, just um, so your analysis segment, the uh, 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 right, you calculate the exact segment of the company for each piece. Yeah. yeah. Then you add the other half and you have a number used in your model. That's so, right. Isn't it in the real, uh, if you just take the whole design and describe the inductance, it would be different? The number you get, you take the whole design and calculate the number of structure compared to just segmenting, it will not match. So this, it does. This approach will be worse case than when, from my experience, you can segment and just add the number. You can. Which other effects? Are your Maxwell equations different? Yours aren't, your Maxwell equations aren't different than mine. In real you don't have to like inductor molecule the PR and inductor molecule You do. Because that is your current path. I, I understand, you know, sort of, I understand what you're saying because this was my confusion too until Stephen, you know, sort of, Stephen stood there and I'm thinking, Stephen, no, you know, I, I, I was, 
I was sort of thinking the same thing you were. They, it is not that, you know, it, it is not, but it turns out that that is our current path, right? And that current path, you know, it's conduction current, which means it's in series. Those inductors are in series, and we can break the inductance down like that. It really works like that. Use your own tool and convince yourself of that. You'll see it will. <laughs> Was, wasn't it you that asked me about how to measure this stuff? Okay, let's, let's, when we talk about having, you know, how to measure this stuff, uh, let's, let's have that discussion as well. The, the trouble, the challenge is, because we're also doing this on the package, okay? The challenge is with the tool set, is, is the tool set, the commercial tool set, does not make it easy for you, okay, to, you know, to calculate the inductance across the planes, right? The commercial tool set does not, but I, have an advantage that you do not. I have elves, and these elves are called graduate students. <laughs> so, uh, so one of the you know, so one of the things that we want to do is is um, you know the precalculations to actually give the precalculations for that piece, you know, piece across. That was the one that I said. Well, this is what we calculated for you today. It's not as you know, it's it's not. It's not great, okay? But it's what I could calculate for you today, but we wanna do, but we wanna do it better for you, okay? And so if you wanna pick this discussion up, you know, the trouble, yeah, the trouble is with the, 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 the commercial tools is it's not easy to get, to get just that piece and that probably could be what you're referring to, okay? With the commercial tools, we weren't able to do it with the commercial tools either, but, 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 but our elves, you know, our elves can, okay? So we, uh, there was one more question. Yeah. Okay, just one, one last. Okay, two, qu uh, three. Okay, the the questions are always short, but unfortunately, I'm a university professor. The answers are always long. Yes, go ahead. Uh, would you go two slides forward? Uh, I find it very strange that. Oh, sorry. Two two slides forward, please. Uh, one more, I think. Uh, the part where we compare the CST model to... Oh, the, yeah. It's 49, slice 49. Yeah. Right, this one. I find it very strange that as the board thickness goes up and the distance from the capacitor to the nearest plane goes up, the error of the approximation goes up as well. I would think that the thicker the board, the less impact the cell of the capacitor would be on the overall inductance. And here it seems to be that for thicker boards, the capacitor is more dominant. Yeah, when we start to get in errors, you know, sort of, you know, when we start to get in errors of a few percent, you know, whether it's 2% or 6%, you know, and we're doing, you know, sort of complicated calculations here. So it's basically uh, just, a numerical, numerical artifact. I, I, I don't know, but, but I don't, you know, sort of when we start to get in that, when we're splitting hairs to that degree, sort of with the numerical modeling, I, I you know, I, that that sort of down in you know in the hair splitting you know domain you know just exactly you know how were things modeled what was the meshing blah 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 you know starts to come into play. Okay. Yes. How can you measure the, the system in order to see how close you are correlated your your method? Um, uh, so. Uh, so this, this, you're probably about the third or the fourth person that asked me that question. So um, I'm going to be around this afternoon. It turns out that the measurements are pretty darn easy, okay? Uh, so I'll just hang out here, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, this afternoon. I have, you know, I have a meeting, you know, for about 45 minutes, 2.15 to, I think, 3 o'clock or something like that. And only then I won't be around. Otherwise, I'll just hang out in the hall, uh, you know, bring your wallet. I don't accept credit cards. No, I'm kidding. And in, in in, turns out to be you know easier than you might think. Do you have a network analyzer at your disposal? Easy. <clears throat> okay. So uh, and there was one more question. So so just you know I'm 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 the I'm the middle-aged bald guy, blue shirt. Yeah, just so find me out in the hall. And one more question over here. <laughs> yeah, yes. yes. Uh -huh. It does. Yeah. 
Okay, so are you talking about on the PCB or on the package? On the PCB, okay. Can so you repeat the question, Jim? So oh, I'm sorry, thank here. you. So, and then this will also ensure that I got the question right. Uh, so the question was, is that, you know, if we're going to use an, in a doublet geometry on a PCB, um, does it, you know, sort of, does it matter, you know, sort of where we put it, you know, above? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so again, it's going to come down to, uh, so again, you know, it's going to come down to where, you know, where do you have your power domain, you know, sort of, you know, your power net area fill in the stack, right? You know, if you have, you know, sort of the power net area fill is up towards the top, the IC, if we say the IC is on the top of board, then you're going to want to put sort of those capacitors, the doublet, okay, you're going to want to put that, you know, sort of on top. If your power domain is pushed down into the board, okay, then I didn't understand your question. Okay. No. No. Right. Right. That's right. You know. So that's right. If you. Uh, uh, I guess about the only caveat, so the question is, is that if you're going to start putting, you know, capacitors, connecting them to the power pins, right? So that's what you're talking about, connecting to the power pins. And then you're just going to connect to the power pins. You're not going to use any, you know, any, you know, one by one, you're going to connect the capacitors to the power pins. And there's only one way you can do it, really, because you have no space there and your pitch is fixed, right? If, and if, so you, have, if you have a, a dog bone uh, fan out, so you have evenly vias all the way down, right? Okay, now you're talking about the package, though, right? Or you're talking about the PCB? I'm talking about the PCB. Oh, okay. The so a little bit dog, the yeah, okay, so a little bit, a little dog bone to go over, you know, to where you're, you know, where you're going to connect. Right. Then, you know, then, you know, you know, where should you put them? It's better if you put them in the interior, but usually, you know, usually if people are going to put them under, you know, under the IC, chances are, you know, sort of they're going to fill that, <clears throat> okay? But if you don't need all those capacitors, it's better if you put them in the interior, because in, in you know, because if you start to put them on the exterior, uh, then, you know, sort of you don't, you don't get the same mutual inductance that you do in the interior. But you said if uh, we spread it uh, symmetrically, it will increase the mutual inductance, right? So if I take uh, <coughs> two pairs and start spreading them at uh, each point, so right. I'm gathering okay. the mutual inductance? Okay, uh, no, because there, you know, that spreading had to do with the mutual inductance when you go across the power net area fill. But now you're under the IC. You're not going across the power net area fill. So now, you know, so do you, it, it doesn't really, you just put them on the pins. It's better if you put them in the interior, uh, you know, because, uh, because then the pin-to-pin -pin mutual inductance is a little bit better for you. Okay. So this approach is, uh, is better if you put it uh, uh, on the top side uh, or the bottom side, but not underneath exactly the IC, right? Because well, it's hard for the, for the equation to calculate it when it's right. directly underneath the pad. Okay, I, I didn't, you know, sort of we're still working out that piece, so I didn't give you any calculations for directly underneath, okay? okay. Now, if you want a calculation, I was trying to get this out of Biao, out of one of the elves who's doing the calculation here, but she wants to do it, you know, all the pieces that mutual inductance, she's going to give me the best thing she can get. us. look, Biao, I, I'm, I'm leaving, I need something, and she wouldn't. Okay, but if you really wanted it, what, what I would do is, is I would just use the calculation that I gave you for the, you know, for the, uh, power, for the IC down to the power net area fill and just extend it all the way to the bottom. You know? And Biao said, well, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't include sort of this little teeny, and she wouldn't give it to me. So she's, she's, she's getting ready to graduate. So anything I say, she knows at least one thing she's not going to like. Okay, yeah, so anyway. Um, yeah, one last question, and then I'm bolting to the door for lunch. So yeah, anyway, yeah, one last question, and I'm certain that they're waiting on us for lunch. So uh, was there a question back here? Okay, let's go to lunch.